I only just started working this new job, and already it warrants keeping some kind of online journal. <laughs> the internet up here isn't so great, but now and again, when I stand in just the right spot, I'm able to get a signal. It probably sounds ridiculous that I'd have so much trouble, considering that I work at a broadcast station where you would imagine it's downright necessary to have contact with the outside world. Well, in these last three weeks I've been here, <laughs> I feel more out of contact than ever. Let me be frank with you all. It's pretty lonely and boring up here sometimes, and other times it's absolutely fucking bonkers. But during those days when it's dull and painfully slow, I think I need some kind of outlet to talk and tell my stories. That's why I've chosen this outlet, so that I can tell you all what it's like up here. Right now, I'm sitting next to the wall by the bathroom. The only spot I can get a tiny bit of Wi-Fi today. My butt is cold, my back is sore, but it's better than not having any internet connection at all. My name is Evelyn. <laughs> it's an old lady name, I know. I'm 24, and I have a degree in journalism, but the best I could do with it right now was supply for a radio DJ position. Three weeks ago, I started working at a broadcast station that sits 50 feet above the ground. Uh, it's on a hill between an old rural town and a long, sparsely inhabited woodland. It's a surreal, lonely, and sometimes maddening place to be. If you live here, which I'm almost sure none of you do, I'm probably the only station you can listen to. The town is nestled between green-covered mountains, but the signal reaches far enough for travelers to hear sometimes. If you pass through a very long stretch of road next to the woods, maybe taking a piss by the trees after passing the rest stop that's been without plumbing for ten years, maybe you've heard my voice or listened to a couple of songs. There's nothing else for miles, and somehow our town doesn't even pick up the tiniest signal from anywhere else. We play a bit of every genre of music to keep everyone in the town happy. By we, I mean myself and the owners of the place who put me here. I'm the only radio DJ working right now. I know a few of you are probably thinking how this place stays running with only one DJ, and I'll tell you, I live here. Since I got the job, I also received a back room inside the station with a mattress, a fridge, and the basics you would expect from a one-room apartment. At midnight, the radio plays an automatic playlist for six hours so that I can sleep, though I've been known to wake up several times in the night just to check how the broadcast is going. Living on site was a part of the deal that many others would probably reject, but it works for me. I lost my home recently, but that's another story for another post. What I'm trying to illustrate is that I've been working alone without more than a few five-minute conversations this entire time. And because I'm the only DJ, obviously there aren't many things involved aside from playing music, sharing the weather forecasts, warning the locals about emergencies, and talking about a bit of local news. Calls happen so infrequently that sometimes I easily forget that anyone is even listening at all. But all that aside, I did say that things are a little maddening around here, didn't I? I imagine what some would think, you know, it's a pretty remote place, only one corner store and one tiny diner for 50 miles, woods all around us, and it would be expected if I said we had some backwoods mischief makers roaming around. That's not it, though. Last week, the same song played on the radio for over an hour. I don't mean it repeated over and over and I couldn't turn it off, like some technical difficulty. It simply never ended. I even remember the song, it was Unchained Melody, and I knew as I listened that it had never been 75 minutes long. There were no calls of complaints, and after almost 80 minutes of listening to the song seamlessly repeat its chorus as if it had been composed that way, I was finally able to simply switch to the next piece on the list. Not before getting a call, though. It was the first call I had gotten in this station. On the other end of the phone was the voice of an old man, frail and hoarse. He simply croaked, Thank you. His words were agonizingly slow painful, dry. It almost sounded like he had a mouth full of dust, and I could swear I could smell the mustiness from over the phone. 
He hung up before I had a chance to say anything to him, but I'm almost glad. I'm not sure he had the energy for another word. Another time, just this last Wednesday, five birds killed themselves on the window. That is to say, they smacked against it so hard, they just dropped. I know for a fact that this tower isn't invisible. It's an eyesore against the view of the trees, really. But on that same day, just minutes apart from one another, five different birds hit the glass of my broadcasting room head first, hard enough to, well, die. All in the same general spot, too. I'm surprised they didn't leave a crack. They did, however, leave a bit of a mess that bothered me for the rest of the day until I finally climbed down to the fire escape with a rag like some kind of old-timey window washer. We also have... interesting rules. There's a board near my desk with a list of guidelines I've been told I have to follow. Rule number one. Never let the radio go silent for more than a few minutes. If the broadcast is down due to technical error, activate the bell. Note that I still don't know what the bell is, other than the fact that there's a button on the wall labeled as such. It remains a tempting mystery. Rule two, take care of the equipment, don't let anything break. Rule three, any suspicious calls must be recorded. Never tape over a recording. And rule four, when the fog rolls in, do not leave the building. Do not open the door. Sound the emergency broadcast. It struck me as very odd that my employer would have such a strict rule about the fog. I mean, after all, this is the main reason why they insisted on hiring someone who could stay at the station 24-7. At least until they get me a coworker. It seemed out of left field, so specific and yet unrelated to any of my duties. I was surprised the fog was enough of an issue to warrant an emergency alarm, really? But only a couple of days into my job, I saw it for myself. On my second day of work, I was put to the test of getting the emergency broadcast out as soon as I could. You see, the entire room I work in has windows all around so that I can see outside in the woods. I assumed at first that this was just for the natural light, but now I'm thinking it's more of a watch. A fire watch, a fog watch, whatever kind of watch. I figure if I'm positioned so high in the trees, it must be for a good reason. I'd been switching between songs, getting ready to introduce an old classic by Fleetwood Mac, when my eyes caught a rolling cloud of white on the horizon. I let the song start, turning off my microphone and rushing to the window, expecting an avalanche coming this way. It seems absurd, I know, but that's exactly what it looked like from a distance. It looked like an avalanche rolling white and gray, moving like ocean waves as it spilled over its own form and moved closer and closer. Fog didn't walk, did it? The fog's movements were so perfectly executed that it reminded me of steps. It undulated as if its motions were being controlled by weight. I almost expected it to make a sound, but that's a stupid thought to have. I didn't watch for too long, slightly startled by the thickness of the fog on its way towards the town. I did just as I was instructed to do and returned to my station, killing the music immediately and taking up the microphone. This is an emergency broadcast for Pines Haven. I was speaking straight from a script using my most stern, clear-spoken voice. This is a heavy fog warning. I repeat. This is a heavy fog warning for Pines Heaven. Return to your homes immediately and wait for further instructions. Please lock all doors and windows. I furrowed my brows at my own words. This was extreme for fog, I thought, but it wasn't going to creep into anyone's house and commit a breaking and entering, was it? I chalked it all up to paranoia. Perhaps it was an unnecessary precaution we were obligated to make for some legality reason, but it still sent a chill up my spine. I turned my microphone off, leaving the music off as well. As much as I loved a bit of Stevie Nicks, it was too interested watching the fog to pay attention to the silence. My eyes were fixed downward. This insanely thick bank of misty-ass fog had almost gotten all the way to the station, 
and was curling around the bottom of my tower. It didn't quite reach where I was way up in the air, however, wisps of clouds still drifted in front of the huge, stretching window that showed me the entirety of the forest. I could see just how far this fog went. It must have gone pretty damn far because it was just about the only thing I could see aside from the tops of a few of the tallest pine trees. And those tall pine trees were moving. I thought it was an illusion at first, brought on by the churning waves of fog beneath, but I was wrong about that. The trees that I could see were shaking, moving from side to side briefly and one at a time. It was almost violent, as if they were being pushed. The most ridiculous thought popped into my head as I realized what it looked like. It looked like something was on its way towards me, crashing through the forest and hitting the trees as it went. The motions were serpentine. I watched one tree shake, then another to its right, then another to the tree's left. All the while, it came closer. I watched all of this with more curiosity than anything else. Judging by the speed, I was about ready to panic at any moment when I suddenly heard something that startled me even more. It was an unfamiliar sound. The phone rang. I ran to the desk and picked up the phone quickly, all the while my eyes continued to stare out the window. Hell, Evelyn! It was my boss on the other end, and he sounded furious. I could almost hear the spit flying from his mouth with each word. Turn the radio back on now! Sir, there's a fog emergency. I didn't think... I know. Turn the radio back on. He hung up the phone before I had a chance to ask questions, but it's a good thing I didn't get that time. I glanced upwards, eyes to fix out the window to see the fog was growing higher and higher. The treetops had all completely disappeared and the window was nearly covered completely. I swore in that moment... I saw something in the murky gray mass slowly pulsing on the other side of the glass. A shape. It was dark, moving shape that was too concealed within the mist to give any semblance of detail. I didn't wait around to see what happened next. I followed my boss's orders, slammed my ass back into the chair, shoved my headset back over my ears, and turned up the music again. Within moments, the signal was live once more, and some bit by the eagles was playing through my speakers and every radio in town as well. I breathed a sigh of relief. What was I so relieved about? As far as I knew, nothing was on the line just because I had forgotten to turn the music back up, other than perhaps my job. There was still a sense of discomfort, however, as I turned my eyes back up to the window. The fog was still there, but it was creeping further and further back down into the woods. In moments, it had sank beneath the bottom of the window and out of sight. The pine trees came back into view, and then, before my very eyes, I watched the horizon appear as the bank of fog slowly dissipated and moved on through. Strangely, I got that same feeling that I was looking at something solid and organic again. Well, the fog stopped after that. I didn't have to make another emergency broadcast, and it's been about two weeks since... Now things are just a normal level of weird. I get a strange call now and then, usually someone from the town I don't recognize saying some gibberish message I can't understand, or now and then a song in my music lineup begins to play backwards. Once or twice I swear I've heard someone talking in the room, even with headphones on, but it's a muffled blur of noise. Yesterday I saw a bird perch on the edge of the window staring at me, and I swear it was human-like, but unless there's some weirdo out there crossing bird DNA with human genetics, it's probably just me being overly paranoid. I think that happens when you've been alone for a really long time. I have a lot more to talk about, and I'm sure in the following days and weeks I'll have more stories and things to write down that might be of interest, but honestly, right now, my butt is starting to hurt something awful from sitting on this cold floor next to the bathroom. The 20 minute music block is almost over and I'll have to go through the local news. Maybe, if you're driving through looking for a place to stop, you might hear me. Oh, and if you are, don't bother with the rest stop. The plumbing is still broken and their coffee tastes like gasoline. It, well, it probably is gasoline. This is Evelyn from 104.6 FM. Have a safe night and be careful out there.
Have you ever met a person who was just too much person? I'm talking about one single human who sucks the energy out of you, as if they were an entire bustling big city crowd somehow condensed into one body. I think we've all met at least one person like this before, the type that makes you wonder how they fit such a big attitude inside themselves without popping like a cheap dollar store balloon. I met a guy like this. He's sitting in the room with me right now. I'm sure you're all here to read about the more unusual things happening up here at the radio station, and believe me, I have some downright creepy shit to tell you about. But first, I need to introduce you to my new co-worker, who just started this morning. Today was his first day, might be his last day too. His name is Daniel. Daniel is a lot. He's loud, full of motion, and may genuinely think he's Bob Barker in the flesh. My boss dropped by during my second week here and noted that I looked weary. He knew why. I sleep four hours a night if I'm lucky and haven't gone outside in three weeks. Dan will be your part-timer, my boss said. Let him take a few responsibilities so that you can get a little fresh air. The folks in town will take a new voice. As hesitant as I was, I knew what he meant. I could use the extra help and those at home could use a little conversation to add spice to their listening experience, but I knew right away that Dan and I mix like oil and water. I decided to let him try his hand at announcing, but the first time he turned on his mic and heard him belt out, Good morning and would you look at that sunshine? I couldn't help but give him a stare of both disbelief and the fear that if he keeps bellowing like that, he'll give every old person in town a heart attack on the spot. He'd cut our population in half. But as much as his over-the-top radio personality irks me, I kind of feel bad for the guy. Not because he tries too hard or because he seems to have some deep-seated need for attention. That's all true, but it's not why I feel bad. I feel bad because, well, right now, he's sitting across the room from me in a fetal position, shivering with blood running out of both ears and one nostril, weeping. As far as first days go, Dan had a weird one. At 8 o'clock in the morning, he arrived. I think he was surprised to see that he wasn't getting some cute, spunky thing as his co-worker, but rather my tired self with a messy braid and a hoodie filled with two warm granola bars that I had forgotten about, but would be delighted to find later on. At 9 o'clock, I let him give the weather forecast, and he did so with enthusiasm. Then at 10 o'clock, I had to explain to him that the bird on the window with human-looking eyes has been hanging around for days now and probably isn't up to anything. It's just ugly, I reassured him. At 11 o'clock, he told me that there was some creepy human sobbing coming from inside the bathroom sink. I was a bit shaken that he hears it too, but shrugged it off by telling him that it doesn't excuse him from washing his hands. Then at noon, exactly on the hour, we got a caller. This was a very, very unusual. Of all the things considered weird, the weirdest was the reminder that other people actually live here. I stared at the screen for the longest time, trying to figure out whether or not to answer the call, but ultimately decided that it would be ridiculous not to. Hello, caller, we've got you on the line. I spoke in a soft, mature radio voice. The line was quiet for a moment, but I could hear a bit of static and the slightest hint of a breath. Y yes Evelyn. It was a woman's voice, probably about 70 years old. She sounded as if she were shivering, which I assume was just jitters from being live on the air. My name is Rose. I had something I'd like to tell you. Of course, Rose. What's on your mind today? Well, I... I've had a bout of strange dreams, dear, and I'm wondering if anyone else has had the same. You see, last night I had a dream in which the forest split in two, like, uh, the, the, like the parting of the Red Sea, dear. I hope you know the story of Moses, don't you? I spared a glance towards Dan, my lips curved upward in a tiny smile mixed with a grimace as if to say, Oh boy, here we go. He returned it with a witty grin of his own, glad that I was the lucky one to answer. Um, sure I do, Rose. What, what happened next? 
Well, the, the ground was open and something was rising out of it. It blocked out the whole sky, you see. I can't even describe it, but it covered everything. The town and the, and the sun, all that my eyes could see. The sound it made was a fearsome bellow that shook the whole earth and then I woke up. You think that God lives in the forest, dear? Dan apparently saw the expression on my face, unwilling to answer for fear of, well, offending or uh, encouraging any other very zealous callers, and so he finally did something good for me and answered in my place. That's an interesting dream, ma'am, but I think if God lived in the forest, he wouldn't give you a nightmare like that, he laughed. But his laugh was cut off by a snappy tone from the woman on the line. Well, he tried. We're meant to be afraid of God, dear. Yeah. Her voice sounded like a slither, like a hiss. For an old woman, she almost struck a bit of fear in me with that tone. Besides, I wasn't talking to you. My grimace was gone, replaced by a furrowed brow of concern and a very, very obvious discomfort. I didn't like this conversation. It had gone from oh boy, to oh no, to oh shit, very, very quickly. I had three weeks to get used to some of the weird mind tricks around this place, but this was different for me. This was real human conflict that I couldn't just blame on the stress of isolation. Rose's words and the way she said them bordered on malicious. That sweet, nervous, grandmotherly tone was gone, and suddenly, I felt as if I were on the phone with someone who genuinely had ill will towards us both. I'm afraid it's time for the weather, Rose, but feel free to call back should you keep having those very interesting dreams. Thank you for calling, ma'am, and have a wonderful afternoon. I ended the call, then faced Dan with wide eyes while mouthing the words, Block that number. I wish I could say that the weirdness ended then and there, but <laughs> we're never so lucky. After the call from Rose, we had more calls. Two, and then three, then seven, by the time five o'clock rolled around. They were all very similar. People in town were recounting their dreams, but they weren't all elderly people talking about God or whatever eldritch abomination they saw rising out of the woods. I heard all types of people, all types of voices young and old, some a little quirky, and others who seemed more skeptical. One caught me off guard. I still remember her words perfectly. It was a young woman, maybe my age, and she sounded as if she was hesitant, but somehow still desperate to tell anyone about what she had seen. I saw a bird with human eyes, she told me. Right away, I was curious, as this was something a little too real on levels of weirdness. In a dream? No, the woman answered. There was a harsh intake of breath from the other side. I don't sleep anymore since it started perching at my windows. All of them. Windows that weren't even there before? Sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have called. Before I had a chance to say anything, she hung up the phone. It's difficult trying to think of the best words to explain how I felt after that phone call. Regret, I think. I felt somehow responsible for the sorrow and, and hesitance in her voice, the, the way she saw some need to apologize for telling me what she saw. There was a deep pit of dread in my stomach. I hope she's okay, whoever she is, and that she figures out where all those extra windows came from. I'll admit, I had to take a break from writing this in order to tend to my new coworker. I had said that he had a rough first day. Rough is a bit of a lax word. At first, he was only a bit spooked about the general weirdness up here, but after what happened with our final phone call of the day, there was enough to warrant actual concern for his physical health. I let Dan take over all the controls while I just left long enough to make a sandwich. Realizing that it was almost 9 o'clock at night and I had yet to feed my flesh prison the entire day. Human bodies, they're obnoxiously needy. He had a call come in, which I realized only because I heard him answer it. I didn't even hear it ring. 
It was late and a strange time for calls, but I figured if it was someone being a creep, at least it would be entertaining to see how he handled it. However, Dan was silent after that first initial greeting. Seconds ticked by, and he said nothing. Finally, when I stepped out of the tiny employee kitchen with a peanut butter sandwich in hand, I witnessed my coworker throwing the headphones off of his head and letting out a shriek as he covered his ears. His eyes were wide and impossibly bloodshot. Veins were popping on his forehead and neck, and his moppy, dark hair flew back and forth as he shook his head before dropping to his knees. I could see blood dripping down from his nose over his top lip and his teeth, which were bared in a pained grimace. Through the hair at the sides of his head, I saw dark trickles of blood streaming over his hands as if something inside of his ears had burst. I dropped my sandwich with a few cuss words exclaimed as I rushed over to him, grabbing one of his wrists in an attempt to see the damage. He didn't want to move his hands, and I didn't blame him. With that much blood, I'd be afraid too. His eyes blearily scanned over my face, and I asked loudly if he could hear me. He simply gave me a dumbfounded expression and whimpered pathetically, as if even more upset over the fact that he could only read my lips. Oh god, his ears were totally shot. The music continued to play, however, with the microphone still running and his screaming likely caught on the broadcast. I made the decision to keep the rest of his struggle private by marching over to the console and turning off both microphones. I let the music run automatically and returned to his side where he had fallen over and was now lying with his legs curled up, shivering and traumatized. He looked at me, tried to mouth a few words, but didn't get far before his eyes rolled back and he was out cold in a dead faint. I sat across from him for a long time. My eyes glanced over at the sandwich, which was already being feasted upon by some very fortunate ants that probably thought a merciful god had rained down this gift from the heavens. I left it there, not wanting to disappoint them. That's when I found the granola bars in my pocket. Half melted, but still a very happy surprise. Maybe I was my own merciful god. After a while of watching over Dan and writing up a bit of my day, I noticed him finally stir. He was startled, gasping for breath as if waking from a nightmare, eyes darting around the room until he saw me cross the space to approach him. I got down to his level, lying on my side so that he could see my face clearly and understand what I asked him. We were on the floor side by side, like two kids at the shittiest slumber party ever, not even one pillow to spare. Your face is bloody. You think you can walk to the bathroom? He nodded. Want to sleep on an actual mattress? He hesitated, then nodded again. I had already called an ambulance while he was unconscious, but I knew it would take a while to get here. Our town didn't exactly have a hospital, and anyone who's had to drive around the mountains knows the chore that trip is. Until then, he could rest on the mattress in my employee apartment and sleep off whatever shit he was going through. I was surprised that he got up on his feet as easily as he did, That is to say, without falling over at all. Although his balance was worse for wear. One would suspect as much with two newly injured ears. One would suspect as much with two newly injured ears. I let him sit down on the toilet as I helped clean his face and underneath his ears, letting him wash his own hands. Can you hear me at all? I asked now that we were in a quiet, noise-free room. It took him a moment before he finally spoke up, but his voice was a hoarse whisper that he probably couldn't even pick up. A little, he said, then smirked with a sad excuse for a chuckle. You're friendlier when I can't hear you well. I would have slugged him in the shoulder for that one, but I just laughed and let it slide. It felt weird taking care of someone else. I didn't think I was a maternal type of person, but I found myself being as gentle as possible with his bloodied face, with genuine care for his comfort. He was cleaned up, all except for his ears, which were covered in what bandages we had on hand, and I helped him to the mattress so that he could lie down and rest. Damn, as far as first days go, his was probably the worst I could ever imagine. I really felt for the guy then. First, he was just annoying, but... Now that he was subdued, albeit in a terrible way, he wasn't so insufferable. As he laid down with a bit of a wince, I turned to leave, but not before he waved a hand towards me in a weak, sort of attention-grabbing slap to the arm. I heard it, he mumbled, the volume of his voice fluctuating, but 
still difficult to make out. The color was drained from his face, and he took in a breath laced with an audible shiver. A bellow. God in the woods, like Rose said. My brow crinkled, and I turned away, grabbing a thin, folded blanket from the top of a plastic shelving system and draping it over him. That wasn't some fearsome god, Dan. Just something really wrong with your headset. We'll fix you up, just get some rest. That's where Dan spent the rest of the evening. At least, until an ambulance came to pick him up. It took him damn long enough to get here. I decided to spend the night at my desk, watching the broadcast go without even putting my own headset on. After a while, it became a surreal experience, just watching the music play by itself and trying to imagine who out there was actually listening to it. Maybe I was the only one? It's crazy how I went from hating Dan to suddenly missing his presence now that I was alone and completely uninterested in sleep. And yeah, I know I lied to him. It wasn't his headset. Whatever he heard was very real. But I don't know. He's gone through enough without that to worry about, too. It's after midnight now, and I heard a disturbing sound. The phone started ringing again. Someone was calling in. I took a deep breath. I took a deep, steady breath through my nose and ignored it. This is Evelyn from 104.6 FM and the strangest looking bird is still sitting at the edge of my window. I never knew that ear surgery was so simple. Not to say that it isn't a delicate and skilled process, of course, but when I got the call from Dan's mother, lovely woman by the way, she told me that with an outpatient surgery, they'd be able to decently repair one of his ears and possibly give him some partial hearing in the other. At the very least, they'd fix it up enough to avoid infection. I suppose I always thought that the ear was such a small and intricate part of the body that fixing up those tiny, cramped caverns of bones and delicate vibrations would be a huge deal. A dangerous deal. Turns out, Dan got the surgery the morning after the incident with his headset and is recovering. They think he'll be able to hear well enough to stick around here and do his job, though he may need some hearing assistance once he fully heals. He won't be returning to work for a few days, probably, and may not be wearing a headset for a long time, but while talking to his mother, I heard him in the background saying, Is that Evelyn? Tell her I'm not done being her nuisance yet. So, I guess I've still got a part-timer? A nuisance part-timer? He's just taking a very early, very medicated vacation. While he's out, I've been here by myself, and god damn it, that bird will not leave! I noticed something while looking out the window between giving the forecast and playing a block of commercial free music. It's building a nest. That little shit piece with its damn eyes is building a nest right in front of where I sit all day. Now, I like birds. I generally don't have trouble with any kind of wildlife, so long as it's not trying to pick a body part to run off with, but somehow, for whatever reason, the last thing I want is to see this bird create multiple mini versions of itself. I can just imagine tens of them lined up all around the window, staring at me from every direction, watching what I'm doing. I almost decided to go out there and try moving the nest down into the woods, but I don't want to leave the station unmanned for too long. Maybe I'll wait until Dan gets back and let him take over for a while so I can take that thing far, far away from the tower. I hate this fucking bird. Before I sat down in the morning, I cleaned myself up at the bathroom mirror. The sink was quiet. I know that should be a good thing, but I don't mean clanking pipes or clogged plumbing causing any sound. On Dan's first day, he said he heard the sobbing from down in the pipes, and it shook me a bit. I've heard it too, but I figured it was just me. I figured the isolation of being up here 50 feet in the air, and with no company except for the grocery delivery man, was starting to make me imagine human voices in places where they didn't really exist, but he heard it too. Honestly, I was a bit disappointed that it didn't continue the first time I noticed the eerie silence. I was going to try to convince Dan that we had a colony of mole people living in the plumbing as soon as he got back, but that joke wouldn't solve the mystery. Uh, At this point, humor is just about the only thing keeping me sane around here, but if you ask, did I think it was a ghost down there? A person? Ha! No, I didn't care. So long as it remained a sound and nothing else, it didn't matter where it came from. I forgot about it for a bit. I stopped thinking about whatever was or 
wasn't rather, in the sink and went about my daily work. The skies were blue and clear. The air was chilly, but warm for being in the mountains. All in all, things were mm, boring. But I suppose I could use a boring day after watching my co-worker's eardrums simultaneously rupture the day before. I'll take a boring day over a bloody one. I sat down, putting my headset on and waiting for the automatic music block to come to an end. There were envelopes opened and stacked about with get well soon cards placed in a line above the consoles. Word got out fast that Dan was undergoing a standard minor surgery. And I imagine that anyone listening that evening before who heard his pain screams was quick to hunt down the gossipers for information. At least 10 people in town sent cards straight to the station with the early morning mail. I set them in front of his chair like a cute surprise for when he came back. Even I ordered one for him too, but unfortunately the grocery delivery guy had accidentally been given a happy birthday grandma card instead. I still signed it and put it up with the rest. It's the thought that counts. Good morning, this is Evelyn McKinnon with 104.6 FM. I hope everyone is enjoying the sunny skies today. Daniel Esperanza will not be joining me this morning, but he would like to thank everyone for the kind well wishes and can't wait to return at the end of the week. Stay tuned for the five-day forecast at 8.30 this morning, but until then, enjoy 30 minutes of uninterrupted music here on 104.6 FM. I wasted most of the morning away. The Wi-Fi was close enough that I could sit near my desk and surf the web a little, looking for news to talk about. I was in a bored daze, looking at the clock, waiting for time to pass. The internet is too slow to play much video unless I'm in the mood for a good long buffer. So most of the time, it was just spent staring at a dull screen. At noon, my eyes snapped to the side as a noise came through my earphones. It was the phone. Even while the music played, someone was calling in. I thought maybe it was a request or maybe Dan's mother calling again. Apparently Daniel had said enough good things about me for her to invite me to her niece's wedding in June. <sighs> Sweet woman. I made sure that the audio mixer wouldn't pick up the call or my voice with the music broadcast and with a touch of hesitance, I allowed the voice to come through. This is Evelyn at 104.6 FM. What can I do for you? There was a loud gasp on the other end, then a shaking, shivering sob, and the sounds of a young woman breathing in through a stuffy nose. I recognized the sound. It was less muffled than it had ever been, more direct, more human. It was the same pattern of sobs I heard from inside the sink every day since I started, and the same one Daniel had heard as well. I felt a chilling sensation, like... The sudden gust of wind you feel walking out into a blustery winter night from a warm building. It didn't hit me all at once, but traveled from the top of my head down my back and all the way to the tips of my toes. Every hair on my body stood on end, and every pore and freckle was like a stinging pinprick. And then the words began to come through. You, you have to stop. She was still sobbing, still gasping and sniffling. She paused, and I assume it was to let me speak. Are you all... Oh my god, stop! Stop making excuses! She interrupted me, and all at once, I became confused. Was, was she talking to me at all? I'm so t tired. This, this is my home. I wanted to help you, but you won't let me. I didn't respond. It was as if we were listening to only one half of a conversation, like a recording. Something about the voice sounded familiar to me, enough to make my stomach drop into a pit deep in my gut, but then again, I had heard it before, in the bathroom sink. Had I heard it anywhere else? Please, let me, let me help you. Please, you haven't had a sober a single day since graduate. All at once, I ripped the headset off my ears, pushed my chair back, and left the device dangling on a cord like a pendulum off the side of the desk. It wasn't for lack of reason. I felt the most intense nausea erupt suddenly, stomach churning and mouth watering. No time at all to wonder if I'd be able to calm down or not. I rushed to the bathroom, with the call still going, that voice speaking and sobbing into the air. Vertigo struck as soon as the door was within reach, and those three steps to the toilet felt as if I were walking in a bright, spinning carnival tunnel. My legs buckled at the knees and I went crashing down, white knuckles gripping the edge of the toilet seat as I tried to drag myself towards it. My arm lacked the strength, but it was then that the nausea turned into something else. I was choking. 
<laughs> Shit. If there was ever a time I could have a coworker there with me, this would be that moment. I lost my breath and the vibrant colors that spun around me only grew more blinding, static in my vision as I prepared to lose consciousness. And then, with a desperate cough, I felt a sharp pain as something dislodged itself from my throat. My head hit the floor with a thud, but I found myself staring directly at the thing that had somehow gotten inside of my body. It was a stone. Just a stone. A brown, speckled one, like the kind that you'd find out in the woods, like maybe on a hike or maybe from a riverbed. As far as things you could mysteriously choke on with no explanation, a stone seemed like a rather boring item. But as I looked at it, perhaps with sheer frustration that it had almost killed me, I wanted nothing more than to be rid of it. My arm shook as I pushed myself up, grabbing the stone in my fist. Without a second thought, I threw it into the toilet and flushed the handle, watching it disappear down the cyclone of water. It was then that I swore I heard a sniffle to my right, coming from deep down inside the pipes beneath the sink. You can have it back. I wiped my face with my sleeve, then washed my hands thoroughly before returning to my desk. My headphones were still dangling off the edge of the table, swinging back and forth slowly. I picked them up, put them over my head once more, and was greeted with silence from the other line. The woman had hung up the phone. The sense of discomfort hasn't left. That bird hasn't left. What's worse is I saw it clicking its beak on the window, looking straight at me. It wants to come in. I know how crazy it sounds, acting like I know what a bird wants and is thinking, but this sparrow is too human not to be aware of its expression. Pleading, demanding eyes are staring constantly as I sit at my desk, only gone when it leaves to fill its nest. I? I'm not letting it in. <laughs> There's a fog advisory for Thursday. It's only Tuesday as I write this, but I still find myself staring across the forest expecting to see the hills of trees start to move. I expect to see it burst open. Where does the fog even come from? I'm imagining it now drifting up from beneath the ground, rising into the air, and covering the town and the sun, all that my eyes can see, and the sound it might make, a fearsome bellow that shakes the whole earth. Shit, maybe I shouldn't have blocked Rose's phone number after all. This is Evelyn from 104.6 FM, and I just noticed a brown speckled stone sitting on the edge of the window, class of 2017 written in white paint on its side. I don't know how it got there, but more importantly, who on earth fished that thing out of the goddamn toilet? I honestly never thought I'd dread a Thursday the way I did. It's a perfectly good day of the week, and rarely do you ever hear people complaining about how much they hate Thursdays. There's no, is Thursday over yet, mugs out there next to the Monday ones. However, as the week drifted slowly by, all I could think about was the constant warning of another foggy day quickly approaching. On top of all that, my morning started with a script for a missing persons report. A woman named Jennifer Cook, age 25, had wandered into the woods in a supposed sleepwalking incident, and her status, for whatever reason, had been listed as, quote, an extreme danger. I recognize her name. We were friends in college. One good thing did happen. Daniel decided resting was boring as hell and made the decision to return one day earlier than expected. Still recovering, but plenty well enough to pester me. I almost regretted to say it, but I missed the guy. I guess it's true that you don't always realize you've missed something until it's taken away from you, and even this insufferable pain in my ass was better than the absolute isolation. Beggars can't be choosers. I watched as his eyes lit up, seeing the get well cards that had been left on the side of his console. He snorted when he noticed the one I left for him. Happy birthday, grandma. He laughed as he picked it up, opening the card to find no kind words or even a signature, but a doodle of him with two Beethoven-inspired ear trumpets duct taped to his head. What can I say? I was bored. Thanks, Evelyn, you're a very thoughtful grandchild. <laughs> After the morning weather broadcast, at which time he joined me to announce his return to the station, we turned off our microphones to catch up. I hardly believe it needs saying that catching up for us didn't only involve the mundane. He told me about his procedure in vivid detail, almost excitedly, and to be honest, I was very interested. 
Delicately, he tilted his head to either side to show the scars behind his ears and the surgical dressing still kept on the inside. It was no wonder he still spent most of his time trying to read my lips. Even if his ears had been successfully repaired, he couldn't hear a damn thing with cotton stuffed in there. Eventually, we exhausted talk of scalpels and stitches, and he asked me what sort of bizarre happenings he had missed while on his vacation. Uh, sink is still acting up. The pipes were a little rusty the other day, though. I think that was making it a bit weepier than usual. Did you get any calls? I hesitated, but tried not to look too unwilling to answer. Rather, I pretended I was in thought, looking back at dull and completely unimportant memories before shaking my head. Not really. Um, just a couple of music requests. Some guy in town has a serious crush on Diana Ross. Daniel's eyes were fixed on my face, reading it far after my lips had stopped moving. I think the fact that I avoided his gaze completely was more of a telltale sign of secrecy than anything else. I didn't want to tell him about the crying woman over the phone, the rock that had been in my stomach, or any conversation all of that maester. The feeling of unease that subject caused was so fuzzy, so confusing to me, that I had no desire to go tumbling down that rabbit hole by my own free will. That bird, though, I interrupted, just as he took in a breath to speak, bringing my knees up in my chair and kicking off from the desk to roll a few feet. I practically jumped out of the seat to stomp across the room, headset left abandoned, and a finger pointing out the window. Sure enough, my nemesis was picking at the nest it had built on a tree branch right at the window's edge. You don't like the nest? Daniel asked, as if there were any possible doubt of how I felt. It's gonna have all its creepy-looking babies right in front of our broadcast room! I put my hands to the glass with an exasperated groan. But even as I knocked my fist against the surface, that shitty little bird did not leave. It just stared at me, face turned so that one human eye followed my movements. If its beak had the ability to move in a grin, I am almost sure it would have been smirking at me. I'm getting rid of it. Hold up, I, I know it's weird looking, but you're not just going to kill it. I'm not killing it, I corrected Daniel returning to the desk to hang up my headphones properly. I leaned against the back of my abandoned chair, facing my coworker to explain my instructions. I'm going out on the fire escape to grab the nest, and I'm taking it into the woods. I won't hurt it, I'll just make it a nest in a new spot. You need to take the controls while I'm gone, though. He couldn't wear his headset, but that didn't matter. So long as he could keep the music running on his own and avoid any lapses of silence while I was gone, the plan would be simple and effective. I still try to wrap my head around this feeling or er, urgency. I needed to get rid of that nest and it needed to happen immediately. I had to leave the station in order to get to the fire escape. I know that completely defeats the purpose of the fire escape, but it wasn't worth triggering the alarm just to save a few steps and explaining my stupid obsession to my boss while disarming it. That involved descending endless clanking stairs, downwards and downwards, until I had circled a 50-foot spiral of rusted metal to the cold cement floor. The exit sign no longer glowed, but the door's windows shone a tarnished yellow light from the overcast sky outside. When my shoes sank into the long grass, kicking up tiny pebbles in the dry dirt, I felt a sense of immense insignificance. The world felt big, and I felt small suffocating somewhere in the middle of all that vast and limitless space. It was the first time in over a week I had felt the wind on my skin so directly, and something about standing in the open air failed to feel comforting. I didn't feel freedom. I felt violated, exposed. I felt like a newborn without guidance. I decided to make the job as quick as possible. I secured my flannel around my waist, holding on to either side of the fire escape as I climbed my way upwards. I spared a look out into the mountains, those rolling high hills of rocks and dirt covered newly budding trees and evergreens. Looking at the horizon brought me stress. That stress formed a gnarled ball sitting in my stomach, kind of like a stone, really. I didn't need any more of those in my guts. Okay, you feathered fuck. Once I was at the top, panting breathlessly in the absolute throes of exhaustion, I waved my hand to shoo the bird away. For once, it actually left, but that didn't bring me much comfort. 
It flew away from its nest without panic, as if it wasn't leaving because it feared me. It was simply moving out of the way to perch elsewhere, casually, as if to say, I'm only moving because I want to. I reached down over the metal bars to grab the nest, plucking it off the branch. Now, as much as I hate this bird and as vocal as I've been about that fact, I couldn't bring myself to be rough with its nest. I held it with some level of tenderness, but still held my breath anxiously as I peered into the circular web of twigs and discarded animal furs. There were no eggs, but the nest wasn't empty. With a shudder of disgust and every single nerve in my body wanting to get that damn thing away from me as quickly as possible, I threw that nest as far as my arm would let me, wiping my hands on the waist of my shirt as I watched it fly into the trees. Inside that nest, nestled into the center like a beloved, delicate eggs, were four human fingers chewed off from the knuckle. They were young and slim, the nails painted in partially chipped red polish. It was then that I heard a slither behind me, scraping wet against the metal of the stairs. It was a sickening sound that only added to the chill I felt traveling up my arms and neck. I turned, ready to lock eyes with whatever creature had crawled out of the woods, and found a thick, dirt-covered vine that had grown all the way up the rusted beams and across the first step. I had seen a bird with human eyes, a sink with a human voice, but God forbid would this plant start personifying itself too. Eager to get off that fire escape and back into the station, I stepped over the muddy green appendage and prepared for my shoe to clank against the second stair. It never hit. Instead, another vine, just as slick and swift as the other, snaked its way underneath my foot. Then another. And another. Down, at least three more steps. No matter where my foot fell, it would slide and I'd go crashing down each and every one of those stairs. At last, that's what I thought would happen. As soon as my balance was lost to me, I felt a slimy grip around my ankle, one of the vines grabbing my leg and using an incomprehensible amount of strength to fling my weight away from it. I felt like a fly being swatted with an aggressive hand, as if I was the pest in this situation. One moment, I was staring down at my feet, and the next, I was looking at the ground as I began to fall. Fifty feet was a distance I may not have survived. I flailed in some attempt to grab the edge of the stairway, but happened to fall on my chest pinned over a bar on one of the spirals right below the top. The breath was knocked out of me, arms gripping the rail as pain erupted in my shoulders and my elbows from holding up my weight. I kicked my legs upwards, wrapping them around the closest bar I could find until I was clinging to the edge. The endless forest was in front of me, and all I saw at first was a sea of green. That is when I saw movement on the horizon. It was the undulating, swirling, thick clouds of fog slowly creeping towards the radio station in the town beyond us. And for the first time since I had started working here, I could hear a groan on the wind. It wasn't quite a rumble like one would expect from thunder, but a low, whale-like moan one might imagine would echo from the ocean floor. The fog was making that sound a living thing with a voice of its own. I yelled out some stream of curses mixed with unintelligible sounds of panic as I used all of my strength to pull myself up onto the landing. Choosing the stress of sore arms over a long drop, I pulled myself up, tumbling over the railing and falling to my stomach on the solid metal. As I stood, I lost my flannel shirt on a snag and didn't bother to come back for it, even if it was my favorite. I half ran, half stumbled down the remaining steps, skipping over which ones I could while the ground below wriggled and moved in my line of sight. The same mud-covered vines that had thrown me off the fire escape were crawling their way out of the ground, all of them twitching in agitation. I tripped my way through them, making a dash to the door, but when it was finally within my reach, there was no opening it. The door had been covered from bottom to center in a thick layer of vegetation, overgrown as if the forest had swallowed it in a coat of thorns and branches. Young miniature trees had sprouted from the ground in that short amount of time it took me to leave and come back, their trunks and branches intertwined to keep the door fastened shut. I tore my hands at the bark, the thorns biting into my skin, but with every tug and crack of solid wood, the trees would writhe and snap back into place in a stubborn game of tug-o'-war. 
The distant groan was closer now, wisps of fog surrounding my ankles as it slowly began to cover the ground and grow. But as panicked as I was, I only screamed when I looked back to the door, seeing a darkened face and the whites of eyes staring at me through the window. It was Daniel, knocking on the tarnished yellow glass as he attempted to force the door open on his side. "'Get up there!' I screamed through the door. "'Make the emergency broadcast! Go upstairs!' He stared at me, shaking his head as he tried yet again to bust the door open to no avail. The stained window clouded my face, making my lips impossible to read. I turned around to see the same trees covering the door had now sprouted at the bottom of the fire escape. The fog was tumbling closer, completely engulfing the trees only a dozen feet away from me. With nowhere to go, I turned back to the door with one last desperate attempt to tear the plants away. I saw Daniel's face washed out and blank with fear with both of his hands on the glass, and then, as the fog wrapped itself around me and the radio station itself, I couldn't even see an inch in front of my face. Dan disappeared from my view, as did every single thing except for the swirling gray clouds. I don't think I've ever experienced such silence. There was no wind, no birds. Only the sound of my own labored breathing as the air grew thick with the taste of wet soil. Though I had been facing the door, the clouds in front of my eyes made it seem as if I were floating in some endless waste. It was a sea of cold, heavy air that tickled every hair on my arms and on my head. There was that whale-like groan again. It was followed by the strangest series of clicks, like a tongue against teeth rapidly popping in no real pattern. I wasn't prepared when it touched me. I pursed my lips tightly to keep from making a sound as something sharp and thin grazed the raised flesh on the back of my arm. It was followed by another, then another, like impossibly long fingers or the legs of a spider toying with my hair and poking at my arms. It felt threatening, but also curious, as though whatever it was patrolling in the fog was trying to figure out what I was or what it could do with me. My eyes were clamped shut and my arms squeezed tightly around my body. I can't even begin to describe what it's like in your head when something massive, unseen and unidentifiable pokes and prods as if it, you're its human toy. I was waiting for fangs and claws. I thought for sure in that very moment I was about to be eaten alive by something I would never get the chance to see and my last act on this earth would have been harassing a goddamn bird. My teeth rattled as I waited for a fate that was certainly grim, but it was surprising when I felt all presence around me suddenly back away. The ground shook once, twice, and then the world went still again. My eyes cracked open as I watched the swirling gray clouds in front of my vision slowly begin to clear. The doorway, as well as the gnarled tree surrounding it, came into view bit by bit. The curling ropes of bark and thorns began to unattach from one another and spiral back down into the ground as if they were beckoned beneath the dirt. The door was in my sights as the fog all but disappeared completely. Well, as it turns out, I didn't die. Shocking, I know. I don't think I've ever opened a door so quickly in my life. I rushed inside, slamming it behind me and wasted no time at all sprinting up the stairwell towards the broadcasting room. Pure adrenaline got me to the top in what seemed like an instant, where I found Daniel sitting at the console with a microphone situated in front of his face and the radio line up back on track. It was better late than never. I breathed a loud, heavy sigh and slumped against the wall, movement catching my gaze at the window. My flannel shirt was still caught on the edge of the fire escape, torn to absolute shreds, and waving like a flag of surrender. It was then that I made a solemn oath that should I ever see a bird's nest near the fire escape, it can stay. Hell, I'd throw it a damn welcome party if that would keep this from ever happening again. Since afternoon arrived, some things have come to light. I've gotten more than one angry call from the owner of the network who claims it took us far too long to send the announcement for the people downhill in the towns. A married couple last seen taking a walk near the trees hasn't come home since the fog passed. And of course, we made the missing persons report immediately. I've also got a huge pattern of bruises appearing on my chest from the fall, and I must say, it hurts like a bitch. We did call the police about the fingers. They assured us there wasn't a murderer loose in the area, though that sounds simpler to deal with. I was a bit surprised that the police asked for copies of our caller recordings from earlier in the week, and luckily, the rules of the station meant none of them had been deleted or taped over. 
The only recordings missing was the one Daniel had taken the very moment he lost most of his hearing. Why would our boss delete that after collecting his copies? I overheard whispers of who those fingers may have belonged to. They say the missing girl, Jennifer, was probably the victim of an animal mauling while wandering in her sleep due to a newly prescribed pill she had only just started taking. A sleeping pill. I've decided that when I'm done here, I'm looking at our call records from the last few days. A certain call from a sleepless woman is coming back to me and I may recognize that phone number if I see it again. I suspect it might match a number I still have in my own personal cell phone. I'll be honest, I hope I'm wrong. There's a lot I need to explain once I know for sure. This is Evelyn from 104.6 FM and I might take a walk in the woods later. Here's the thing. It's dark outside, the forest is apparently alive, and you want to go out there looking for a dead body? Daniel had been here only a few days, and already he was mouthing off to me. He moved fast, I guess. I shot him a look, expression cold, as I sat on the floor and laced up the first of my boots. If those fingers were the only part of her disconnected from the rest, there may not be a dead body. She might still be alive. After the last time I sat down to write my thoughts and experiences, I ended up looking back at all of the calls that came through in the last few days. I wasn't looking for the recordings, but rather the numbers, something I rarely paid attention to. My heart sank when I saw that my suspicion had been unfortunately correct. The number on our work phone matched the cell phone number I had listed for Jenny a college friend whom I had graduated with a year earlier. Although, there was a surprise I hadn't quite expected. Jennifer didn't call the station only once. She called twice. The first time to tell me about a bird with human eyes that had been keeping her awake for days. The second time, I heard a woman crying and pleading over the phone. That woman was her. Maybe it's true when they say that no one ever sounds like themselves over the phone. I'm going along with you. Dan was turning in his chair, ready to get up, when I shot him a look of disbelief. No, uh, you're not. I thought I sounded demanding, but he did listen for even a moment. He was already up on his feet, leaning over the console and fiddling with the music lineup. We can't leave the station completely empty. Who are we going to ask to take over for us? That weird-ass bird? The toilet ghost? Excuse you, it's the sink, not the toilet. Besides, I have an idea. He wasn't bluffing either. His idea sounded silly and impossible at first, but the more I molded over in those moments, the more I realized it would work. He told me that we should pre-record all of our content for the night. We'd record the evening weather, the 10 o'clock news, and even a good night message, then put those recordings in the lineup with the rest of the music. No one would know, and if it took much longer than expected, we'd simply set up the broadcast schedule to continue into the six-hour night owl block. I was supposed to leave at ten, Daniel reminded me. He was only a part-timer, whereas full-time took on a whole new meaning for my eternal presence here. It's almost nine o'clock already. You don't think I'll get overtime if anyone finds out we're just dicking around in the woods, do you? There'll be no dicking, but... I'll pay the grocery guy extra to bring you donuts if you do require compensation. I couldn't believe I was actually going to do this. I couldn't believe I was letting Dan do this. Honestly, I didn't know what scared me more. The thought of walking into the woods at night and leaving the station abandoned, or the thought of going alone and leaving Dan with the responsibility of taking my place. Now, I'm not saying he's incompetent, but... I'm almost sure a wild badger could run across the radio console and operate it just as good as he does. He has a lot to learn, is what I mean. We put our plan in motion, recording all of our segments one after another and making a long automatic playlist including those files. With any luck, it would sound just as genuine as live conversation. 
By the time that was finished and the radio was set to play on its own, until just before sunrise, Daniel and I raided the closet for flashlights, water bottles, and a first aid kit just in case. I hoped we wouldn't be needing to reattach any of our fingers, but yesterday's grim findings had brought that possibility up from not worth mentioning to unlikely but could happen. My second trip out into the fresh air didn't feel as daunting as the first. Maybe it was because the fog wasn't set to roll in for a few days, or maybe having an important goal drowned out that feeling of insignificance. I fished my phone out of my pocket, looking at the minuscule number of bars in the corner. Out here, with a wall of trees all around us and a seemingly endless forest through the mountains, it was dangerous not to have some kind of connection with the outside world. I watched the bars disappear as we continued to walk the wet leaves squeaking under our feet. I don't think I've ever been out here. Not this late, at least. Daniel was flashing his light on the ground, then up to the trees at eye level. I hated when he did that. I had some hidden fear that he'd shine the light up suddenly and illuminate something terrifying. You do know your way around, don't you? I was grasping at memories. I had left town so young and stayed away for so long that any recollection of playing in the woods was lost to me at this point. However, I did remember returning. There were bits and pieces of a memory in my brain, but it seemed to melt, as if some of those thoughts ran like water straight out of my mind. I was here about a year ago, but I can't memorize paths that well. But it's not as if we can't see the radio tower from miles away. Daniel shrugged, nodding his head and accepting that answer. He looked back at our metal and wooden sanctuary, which sat so tall on the hill with a huge tower looming above it that it would be near impossible not to see it from almost anywhere this side of the forest. I stared forward in the dark, squinting as Daniel moved his light back to get a view of the station. I kept my own flashlight turned off in order to save its battery in case his ran out. But I had to admit, his constant tomfoolery with that damn flashlight was going to get on my nerves if he kept it up. Will you stop that? What? Dicking around with the flashlight. What about the flashlight? I raised my voice for him, remembering the cotton in his ears. You're dicking around with it! Before I could finish that sentence... A sound erupted from in front of us, even loud enough for Daniel to hear through his bandages. It was the groan of an animal, either aggressive or in defense of itself. Dan whipped back around, his flashlight pointing straight towards the source of the sound while I stopped in my tracks and stood perfectly still. It was an elk, enormous in size, with eyes glowing white at us in the darkness. There was no way it could have gone unheard, leading me to believe that it had been standing there perfectly still all this time. Its antlers clacked against the surrounding trees as it shook its head, stomping its front hooves into the dirt and stone. Dan and I both backed up several feet, but the elk didn't charge at us. Rather, once it was finished making noise and stomping about, it turned and stared at us for the longest moment, Its eyes were reflective orbs, but I watched it blink. Its eyelids were to the right and left, meeting vertically like that of a reptile. Then, with a heavy grunt, it bounded heavily away further into the woods. I noticed between instances of wondering how close I had been to shitting my pants just now, that it ran with a really odd gallop. It had three back legs. One on one side and two... On the other, it was a seriously fucked up elk. Is there anything out here that doesn't look like an absolute abomination? Daniel asked in a hoarse whisper, his flashlight slowly scanning in a search for anything else that might be hiding in the trees and overgrown brush. There was nothing, not even a sound. After a few hesitant moments, we were on the move again, though I decided shouting probably wasn't the best decision to make. I was looking down at my phone, watching the bars in the left corner. I wouldn't have expected to have any signal out here, but strangely, a single bar kept flashing and then disappearing, as if it wanted to find a connection. I had no explanation for it, but I didn't think on it too much. 
<laughs> of all the weird crap I'd seen out here, a cell phone signal in the woods was the least of my curiosities. But if I could get just one more bar, maybe I could try making a call. How, uh, how do you know her? Daniel broke the silence after we were sure no more giant mutated elks were stomping around. This missing girl, I mean, you seem dead set on finding her. She was my best friend in college. We had a dorm together, we graduated together, we, um, well, we lived together for a bit. She was generous uh, when I needed a place to stay. And now you live in a radio station. I turned my eyes back to my phone, shrugging my shoulders. I acted nonchalant, like I didn't give two shits. I actually gave quite a considerable amount of shits. She, uh, she didn't, didn't want me there anymore, okay? She just didn't want me there anymore. I could feel the question in the air. I didn't have to look at Daniel to know what he was thinking. How badly he wanted to ask why a generous best friend would kick someone out of their house. Luckily, before he had a chance to speak and before I needed to think of a new conversation, I saw it. Two bars on my phone, springing to life and defying all odds against this wild, uninhabitable mountain. I raised my phone up in victory, stopping exactly where I stood for fear of losing the signal. Yes, we have it! We have a signal! Daniel gave me a confused stare before I had a chance to explain. I was tapping away at my phone, finding Jennifer's phone number among my minuscule list of contacts. I'm calling her. If she's nearby, she, she can help us find her, um, assuming she has a signal and battery. Assuming she has her phone... Daniel was obviously skeptical why a sleepwalking woman, presumably leaving her bed, would take her phone, but I had a theory that Jennifer hadn't been sleepwalking at all. Something had been luring her here. I just, I, I had a feeling. I didn't answer him, whispering a hoarse shh as the phone began to ring in my ear. It rang once, then twice, then in both of my ears? Her tone. A basic selection from the library of sounds was distant but audible in my one exposed ear. I lowered my own device, listening to the sound echo from further in the trees. Faint, but there. Daniel turned to the direction of my gaze, flashlight scanning along the ground to find a path of broken twigs and flattened grass trailing off deep into the brush. What are you... her phone... That was all I said before I chased the glow of his flashlight on the ground, deciding that one source wasn't enough. I pulled the spare light from the satchel around my shoulders, tapping it against my hand as it flickered to life. The tone stopped ringing, and so I called it again, desperately hoping this wasn't just a trick my ears were playing. I couldn't help but feel some level of, of paranoia, knowing that this forest could be drawing us further in with, like, illusions of sound and direction. I'm perhaps that's exactly what it did to Jennifer. I felt a sense of familiarity with the forest then. I knew this path. I almost felt sick the moment some old buried memories started to resurface, but not because those memories traumatized me. No, the nausea was part of the memory. I remembered the campfire roaring high in the center of a clearing one person's distinct voice nagging that it would burn the trees down if it got any hotter. I remember tripping over beer bottles and the sound of shitty guitar music. Some drunk idiot singing off-key... Oh, shit. Maybe I was the drunk idiot singing off-key. You know, that was probably me now that I think about it. I could hear Jenny's voice mingling with the crackling of fire and terrible music. Evelyn, lay off. You've had enough. Don't you scream at me. God, you're such an ass. And to imagine that graduation party was the last time I had ever seen this place. Until now. God damn, why did I ever come back? <laughs> oh, Christ. I heard Daniel yell before I caught sight of what he had found. And God, I wish I hadn't seen it. I turned my light to him, first catching a glimpse. 
as he staggered back with his eyes glued to the ground in front of him, and then (laughs) I foolishly illuminated the grass below. There was blood soaking every inch of grass and dirt that I could see, bits of cloth and who knows what else strewn around the forest floor. And a man, the top half of him, uh, at least, nearby the bottom half of another person, this one was wearing a pair of khaki shorts and walking shoes, but both of them had been separated across the middle, only one half of their bodies thrown down where we could see them, and the rest, well, I shouldn't have scanned the light upwards, but the sound of creaking tree branches tempted me. My light followed the trunk, stained all the way up until it illuminated what happened to be the other halves of the two corpses. They were stuck in the branches by their clothes and their limbs, as if thrown into the air and getting caught wherever they fell. The second body was of a woman, but uh, but it wasn't Jennifer. I I felt sick. All of the shadows and shapes were swirling around in my vision, pungent smells not only in my nose but on my tongue as the full wave of that terrible scent hit me. I gagged, but before I could turn my full body away from the scene, my light caught something else. Uh, The glow of eyes from the trunk of a nearby tree. Let me let me just say I've I've seen some uncomfortable things merely in the time I've been working out here in the woods. I don't I don't just mean gruesome, terrifying things, but unsettling things, unusual things. And as of right now, this takes the cake. Oh, um we found Jennifer. She she was in one piece as far as I could tell. Uh, aside from a hand missing every finger except for, ironically, the middle one. I'd like to think that this was some final joke from whatever murdered her, but um, that's probably wishful thinking, where humor is realistically non-existent. Oh god, she was she was stuffed. Uh, her limbs twisted to roll her into a human ball inside the hollow trunk of the tree, with her stark white face peering through a hole in the bark eyes were open wide and staring forward oh God. <laughs> making her look like some kind of pale nightmarish owl her mouth oh god her mouth was wide open filled with like dry grass and twigs almost uh almost like a bird's nest one of her hands was sticking out of the tree the arm likely broken in order to accomplish such a position Her hand was tilted, palm pointed upwards, and a cell phone was sitting in the center flashing its 10% battery warning. Well, that and two missed calls from me. My name was on the screen, Evelyn, followed by an alien emoji, which it was perfectly appropriate. There's not a single damn person on earth who could convince me she wasn't positioned that way on purpose. We weren't even friends anymore, but shit, man, I really failed her one last time. (laughs) At least I'm consistent, I suppose. Daniel and I knew we couldn't stay there. Not only was it a fucking nightmare to behold, but the smell from the blood and bodies on the ground was making both of our stomachs churn. There's a smell you don't really forget, I don't think. It's it's been a full day, and I still recall it in vivid sensory detail. So we turned back to leave, completely silent. We, we had nothing to say to one another. Nothing comforting and no energy even to talk about our fears. We were halfway back to the radio tower when Dan finally spoke up. <laughs> you know, he started. I wanted this job because I thought it might be right up my alley. I thought I'd be good at it and maybe make some people laugh and smile a bit, but so far, uh, it's only been horrifying. Now, while I know that hiring Dan had been one of my responsibilities, I still felt a twinge of guilt. He meant well, and his heart had always been in the right place, but he, he was suffering for it. He had the chance to leave, but chose to come back regardless. Sometimes I wondered if this bizarre, messed up situation was the only exciting thing he had to look forward to. At least until actual death entered the picture. Now he was in too deep. We both were. 
Hey, Dan? I asked him, shining the light on my own face. Yeah? Your mom invited me to a wedding in June. Um, do you mind if I go with? He laughed. It was the first time I had heard him laugh like that. Well, ever. I didn't say much, considering we had known one another for less than a week. But time seems to drag out after you've seen some freaky shit with someone. Matching tuxedos? He offered. I nodded decisively. With plaid bow ties. The rest of the walk was quiet. We got back to the radio tower after midnight. The late night music block beginning on its automatic run just as we had planned. I took the opportunity to take the evening slow. No need to rush back to the console or even to that old, lumpy mattress where I slept. Daniel was leaving, as I expected and, and wanted him to, but I made an extra effort to stand out in the gravel driveway and tell him goodbye. I could have been emotional about the whole thing, like thanking him for saving my life in the fog or for insisting on going with me to find Jennifer. Uh, instead, I just told him to drive safely and to show up in one piece on Monday. Uh, two pieces at most, so long as it's a small loss. He just pointed to one of his ears and said, I already made my blood sacrifice. I spent a long, long time that night just sitting cross-legged in my chair and looking out the window. I had headphones on, um, listening to music. I, I almost wanted to turn on my microphone to, just, just to ask who was out there listening with me, but I'd be too disappointed if nobody called in with an answer. This is Evelyn at 104.6 FM, and I have some advice. Don't treat your friends like shit. I'll start this off in the most direct way possible. I'm not who you think I am. I work at the radio station perched in the air looking out over a forest-covered mountain range, and it's an absolutely bizarre place. I've seen animals with human features, some eldritch abomination living in a fog bank, and I even went partially deaf due to a phone call. On top of all that, my coworker Evelyn McKinnon, just uh, became a murder suspect. She didn't do it. There's no way she could have done it, and I think everyone in this tiny, superstitious town knows that. I may not have been here long, but I've been here long enough to know that when something strange happens, people know when to turn their heads and ignore it. The death of a well-respected couple and a promising college graduate gets people just a little bit riled up, however. If you've read her posts, you probably already know who I am. My name is Daniel Esperanza. I'm a part-timer at the radio station, and right now I'm taking over Evelyn's full-time position until she gets back from a drive into town. She's not arrested. At least, I don't think she's arrested. The police came by to ask a few things, which is understandable considering how our tower is less than a half mile from the scene. Some things happened, and they took her into town. I haven't heard from her since. I'm sure you're all wondering a couple of things. First, how did I log into her account? And also, why would I ever choose to work at this backwoods piece of garbage on stilts? The second is a story for another time, but uh, the first one is simple. I called in an anonymous tip to the police last night after I left. It was Evelyn's idea, seeing as there's no way they wouldn't be able to trace the radio tower and I'd have an easier time finding a public phone than she would, but after the police promised to stop by the woods and confirm what we had found, I stopped in to see that Evelyn had packed up her laptop and was giving it to me for safekeeping, she'd said. She told me that this online document she's been keeping wasn't supposed to be found. Um, it was a good idea to get it far away from her just in case they had any questions. So I have her laptop. She was still logged in and, well, I guess I've got a story worth telling too. It was early, about 7 o'clock in the morning when I called in the anonymous tip and then rushed back up to the radio station to warn Evelyn that there might be visitors. The drive there is daunting. This town sits nestled so tightly between a range of mountains on all sides that you'd swear it was donut-shaped, with the townspeople all stuffed into the center. It's a winding, swirling, hazardous path to get out of here, which is why people rarely come and no one ever seems to go. As I followed the path to the edge of the woods, the ground becoming steeper as I went, there's a natural feeling of heaviness that just sits on top of you as you look up into the trees. 
The way the mountains raise, it looks like the trees grow miles high, but it's just an illusion created by the thickness of the forest. It's suffocating. And really, no wonder why people seem to get so lost so often. Like, uh, looking up at a giant sitting at the bottom of the mountains can make even the strongest human feel small, puny, and uh, insignificant. Thankfully, I'm nowhere near the strongest human, so feeling insignificant is less of a steep drop for me. I understand this isn't the time for self-deprecating jokes, though. Evelyn wasn't on edge when I arrived at the station, uh, though she was surprised to see me. I found her where she usually is, sitting in the chair behind the console, staring off into space. I don't think she goes into the details too much, but anyone who believes she spends her days buzzing around and keeping busy is a bit mistaken. In the week that I've known her, Evelyn spends an almost worrying amount of time in silence, looking tired and even sick. Uh, every day, she looks more and more like the poster child for anemia, and when she's not screaming at a bird or answering creepy phone calls, she spends the rest of her day seeming miserable with a few short intervals of pretending to laugh at my jokes. I know she's faking it as to not disappoint me. I just want to tell her that she doesn't have to try so hard. I told her that I called in the tip, and she already seemed prepared. She gave me her laptop and charger, all packed up in a case, and told me to put it in my car. It was then I was noticing the edge I hadn't seen before. She was expressing her anxiety in silence, eyes avoiding mine and her arms staying close to her sides or crossed over her chest whenever possible. I studied theater. Trust me, I know the telltale signs of someone who isn't feeling very confident. Now it'll be fine, I assured her, even though I had no idea what we were in for. We didn't do anything. Maybe they won't even bother us. As it turns out, I was wrong about that. I left the radio tower, heading back to the tiny gravel parking lot that ended a long, twisting path through the woods. I took the laptop case to my car, where I hid it on the floor of the back seat, underneath a few bags of plastic bottles I kept forgetting to recycle. It was a good thing I did it then, because the glow of headlights at the end of the long, winding gravel road were coming closer. A police car and an ambulance drove right up near my car in the small, cramped space just big enough for employees. You work here? One of the officers asked me. He was a tall, broad-shouldered guy who looked like he could possibly pick me up and toss me into the woods like a tree branch. Uh, yes, sir, I answered without hesitation. It didn't matter that Evelyn and I were innocent. Acting suspicious in any way wasn't a good idea, and it didn't help that we were already hiding her written evidence. I was just stopping by for a few minutes. Um, can we help you? Who's we? asked the second one, a female officer. What she lacked in size, she made up for in the most stern, thin-lipped expression I had ever seen. Now, I'm almost 30 years old, and I still felt like I was about to get grounded just looking at her. Uh, myself and my co-worker, you know, uh, Evelyn McKinnon. Thought I recognized your voice. The female officer was the first to step forward, while the other followed right behind her. My eyes trailed off to see two remaining police officers, as well as their leashed canine and two medical responders, passing us to go straight into the woods with all the tools to mark off a crime scene. As part of an ongoing investigation, we're going to have to ask a few questions to the both of you, as well as to ask that you don't go wandering into the woods today. Is that all right? It's fine. It's going to be fine, I was thinking to myself. We had nothing to worry about. We weren't, we weren't criminals. Still, being face to face with authority, uh, especially when they were just itching to put someone behind the bars for a triple homicide, was not the most comforting place to be. Of course, come, uh, come right up. I led the police into the radio station where Evelyn was sitting with her headphones over her ears and fingers adjusting the console controls after her first morning announcement of the day. She didn't even hear the door open, and I hated to startle her. When saying her name didn't catch her attention, I reluctantly reached down a hand and nudged her shoulder. That was certainly enough to get her eyes on me, at least, though she jumped so suddenly that I thought she'd lose her headphones in the process. Don't do the- She stopped speaking. Words halted in their tracks as her eyes glanced from me to the two officers standing by the door. It wasn't in this if she didn't expect their company, but she still looked uncomfortable when all four eyes locked on her. Microphones were silenced, the radio was set to automatically run for the next half hour, and the police got to questioning the both of us. 
it started pretty normal, pretty uh, unassuming and easy to answer. Did anyone stop by the station in the last two days? Did you happen to see anyone suspicious outside? Have either of you had any contact with missing individuals? Luckily, the answer to all three of those was no. I admit I was further out of the loop than Evelyn was. She spent all of her time here and had known Jennifer Cook for years, whereas I had never even visited this town before hearing about the job offering. They seemed to pay far more attention to her than they did to me. There was a moment when one of the police pointed out a dark bluish mark peeking out from the edge of Evelyn's neckline. She put a hand to her chest as if she'd forgotten about it until the pain came flooding back, the moment her palm touched the spot. All it took was a pull of the fabric to reveal just a small portion of the huge, elongated bruise that stretched across her upper ribs and breastbone. Where'd you get that? The male officer asked. I could tell Evelyn was taking a moment to think, realizing that the story of how she'd gotten the bruises was pretty far-fetched. Things were weird around here, but maybe not weird enough to openly admit that sentient vines had uh, tossed her and pinned her against the fire escape. I was uh, out on the fire escape and fell, she admitted, but refused to elaborate any of the stranger details. When I rolled down the stairs, I hit myself hard on one of the handrails. <laughs> they didn't press further, but it didn't mean they weren't still keeping those details in their minds. It was uncomfortable watching how intently they glared, taking in every small detail. I knew it was just part of their job, but it felt almost unnecessarily intimidating. Minutes passed, then a half hour, then an hour, and the only time the police weren't asking questions was when Evelyn and I tended to our work to keep the radio running. They were almost too attentive when it came to making sure everything was going smoothly with the broadcast, but then again, they did live in the town below. There was no way any of the bizarre stuff that happened around this building didn't get their attention. Maybe they even knew more than we did about this old radio tower. I think I was the first to see movement in the woods. My breath hitched in a small gasp, and I think the police heard me because moments later, they were swiftly marching to the windows to see their fellow officers emerging from the forest. The medical team carried back two cloth stretchers covered in white sheets. Two. Only two. We were told to stay in the broadcast room until the police returned, and we watched nervously as they exchanged words below us. Silence through the glass. Evelyn said nothing, but she looked alarmed as the men and women below took turns making glances up to our location. Something was wrong here. Evelyn paced back and forth until the police came back upstairs, one of them holding a familiar object. Jennifer's cell phone. Well, shit. With a gloved, clad hand, the female officer held up the device, which was supporting a dangerously low battery and two missed calls from the night before. The phone should have been dead. I thought, yet somehow, it was kept alive through the entire night. Just, uh, just long enough to reveal its secrets. My coworker's face was washed out paler than ever when she realized that her name was flashing on the screen. However, what they said next was perhaps even more chilling than all of the facts laid out in front of us. Miss McKinnon, it appears you and Jennifer Cook were in contact. Any clues to her whereabouts you're not telling us? My heart sank, and I know hers did too. She looked at the two figures in front of us, then at me, her mouth slightly agape with the beginnings of a question that just wouldn't come out. Her whereabouts? Jennifer had been out there. She was cold and dead in the trunk of a tree, and if they found her phone and the other two people, how the hell did they not see her? The only answer I could possibly think of was that she wasn't there anymore. But if that was true, or who or what had pulled her out of the tree, I, um, <laughs> I know her. Evelyn's lips trembled. I I'd never seen her look this close to tears. In fact, I didn't even know she ever cried. Ever since Jennifer was announced missing, Evelyn had made an effort not to talk about their former friendship. It was easy for me to forget that she probably was grieving behind that mask of indifference. I, I was just thinking about her uh, and thought I'd try, but she didn't pick up when I tried to call. We haven't talked in over a month. I, I promise, I don't know anything. <laughs> this time, she wasn't lying at all. This new development put us far into the dark as we could possibly get, making me question everything I had seen the night before. 
there was no way we both dreamed that up, was there? No, not when the rest of the scene fell into place. The other two bodies had been collected, but Jennifer had been taken while the others were left behind. I couldn't even begin to think of a reason why. God, I, I can't believe I even let it cross my mind, but for a split second, I had the chilling thought that maybe Jennifer had gotten herself out of the tree. There was a lot of weird shit out there in the woods, and I was not ready to start worrying about the walking dead, too. Evelyn's answer was honest, but it wasn't good enough for them. Deciding that this wrong place, wrong time situation wasn't satisfactory, Evelyn was given a beckoning gesture of the hand from the female officer, whose other hand hovered close to her side. It wasn't where her gun was placed, but rather the handcuffs. She must have noticed that Evelyn looked down at them because she moved her hand away almost on cue. We have more questions, but we'd like to wait until we get to the station to have a real talk. If you... <laughs> if I don't argue, you won't cuff me? Evelyn finished her thought while peeking out from the hair hanging in her face. The policewoman gazed at her and then silently nodded her head. My coworker never did have the most expressive face. She often looked weary or annoyed, sometimes a bit of both, but this time she looked towards me with a heavy frown and eyes that could only be described as soulful. I could tell she was scared, but not with the type of fear we faced before now, faced with impossible things. It was very realistic dread with no disbelief, and it was the saddest thing I'd ever seen. Follow the rules, okay? That was the last thing I read from Evelyn's lips before she was escorted for questioning. <laughs> it's been so long now that I, I can't help but feel something went wrong and maybe she's not coming back before the day is done. I want to leave. I want to go find out what happened to Evelyn, but unfortunately I can't do that. I have to make sure the broadcast never goes silent. This is Daniel at 104.6 FM and I might be your host for just a little while longer. Snooping through someone's computer is a quick way to make an enemy out of a friend, but I somehow justified my decision. Out of all the confusing and traumatic things Evelyn and I have witnessed, my invasion into her posts wasn't quite as bad as, well, murder, was it? First, I think you all need to know. It's been a couple days now and I haven't heard from my coworker at all. It's almost like she's dropped off the face of the earth. I've been handling this radio station on my own and things haven't been as weird as they usually are. There's no crying from the sink, no freaky looking bird outside the window, no fog. However, I was still uneasy as the police were almost always present on their search in the woods looking for that girl's body. The fact that they couldn't find it, even in the light of day, gave me the sinking feeling that Jennifer was out there somewhere, moved or hidden, maybe devoured, who knows. I saw the same officer from the day they dragged the two bodies out of the woods, taking Evelyn with them. She looked just as stern and just as unfriendly as before, but at least she allowed me to ask her a question. I simply asked her when and if she expected Evelyn to be done doing her part in this case. I hope my role as the concerned trainee would convince her to give me an estimate on when I might see her again, especially after I pressed that I was having some difficulties adjusting to a sudden full-time position. Guilt tripping a cop isn't something I would advise. Can't be sure of that, she said matter-of-factly. Depends on how well she cooperates. We can't question her yet, though. Had to let her go in for uh, medical treatment first. She refused to elaborate any further. I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was. Evelyn didn't look her healthiest, but I somehow doubted she would have agreed to a hospital stay in the middle of this mess. No, I feel that there's something else going on. That, coupled with all of the unexplainable things we've seen and my curiosity for what she'd witnessed on the days I was gone, prompted me to look around her computer whenever I had some free time. Now, I don't know if she was hiding things from me, more than a few things, really. Her thoughts seemed scattered, documents filled with revisions and half-written bits of her daily experiences, but um, it still looks like she's avoiding the follow-through on so many thoughts. It was cloudy in the early afternoon as I ate lunch throwing away half of what was in the fridge that Evelyn hadn't touched and committed to reading all of her prior posts. That stone, the, the crying woman on the phone, that thing in the fog. 
I almost can't believe how much she was hiding from me. And yet I have this feeling that too much of this is personal. I should have stopped there, but I didn't. I'm ashamed to admit that my curiosity got the better of me and I looked at her internet history. It was a lot of this, this website and her posts. I mean, it seems as if she dedicates most of her time to writing, but there are a couple of other things. Uh, Facebook page, notably. The rest looked like the product of boredom. Clickbait articles, dumb quizzes, uh, Google search for mountain birds. I told myself I'd visit the Facebook page for just long enough to check my own, not expecting hers to still be open. Apparently she hadn't logged herself out at all, because the moment the page finally loaded after a long lapse of inactivity, there were unchecked notifications on the screen. There were so many that it seemed like Evelyn hadn't read through them in weeks, and she posted even less. Much of the content on her profile belonged to other people. Some relative of hers, maybe a great aunt, asked, How you been? Which she never responded to. A young woman had tagged her in a post with several others, calling for a group hangout sometime, which she didn't react to. And then there was a library of tagged photos. Photos other people had taken. I admit that I smiled at first looking through them. They must have been from last summer because Evelyn's hair was shorter and she had a sunburn across her nose, mixing in with some major sun-induced freckling. There were pictures from a college graduation ceremony featuring her with all of her friends and professors. She was smiling widely, grinning with all her teeth, looking bright. The last graduation photo was of her and a familiar woman making faces at the camera. It was Jennifer. As I continued looking through, I saw Jennifer a lot more often, mostly on photos she had taken. Lynn and I went hiking today. Moving day with Lenny. Evelyn and Jenny, couch lifting champions. Then there was a dark and blurry photo. It was the first of many. Someone had posted an album tagging Evelyn and at least 15 other people, but it was full of pictures from the woods. My smile started to disappear. Seeing that forest and the flurry of blurried faced strangers, most of them drunk or in clouds of smoke, made the photos seem ghostly. Then I saw her again. Evelyn was in the background of a few photos, sometimes so small that I had to pay an awful lot of attention to see her. She was smiling in one or two, talking in another, and then one photo in particular chilled me right to my very core. Evelyn was at the edge of a group, as if pulled into a photo while passing by, but my coworker was pale eyes wide and glowing from the reflection of the camera flash and her face was stuck in a grim look of terror. It was clear something had happened. She had seen something she didn't want to see. I couldn't get away from the photo any faster and so I skipped forward again and again. She was in almost every picture, holding a cup in her hand each time and I watched the progression from that scared, tired look to near unconscious as two friends were holding her up in the background. Either she was drugged completely wasted, or both. And then her and Jennifer both disappeared from the remaining photos, leaving no trace behind. I regret lingering so long on the photos because my online status, or rather Evelyn's online status, had caught someone's attention. I saw the blip of an instant message, and the chat automatically popped up at the corner of the screen. Reading her messages was the ultimate betrayal of any kind of privacy, but uh, I couldn't refuse just a small peek. Evelyn, if you're reading this from some time from now, I hope you don't kill me f for this. <laughs> I scrolled through. It was a person I hadn't seen, though Jennifer was one of two faces in his profile photo. Didn't matter as he made his purpose as the go-between very clear through a flood of at least 20 unanswered messages over the course of a month. His name was Elijah. April 2nd. Hey Lenny, can we talk? April 5th. Where are you staying? Are, are you getting help? April 18th. Jen has been asking about you a lot. Um, she really wishes you'd unblock her. April 23rd. Evelyn, please. And just now. Lynn? Hello? As I scrolled upwards, I found the messages that started it all. It was on the first of the month. April Fool's Day. Hey, Evelyn, Jen told me what happened. I hope you get well soon, but please take it easy from now on. She can't babysit you just to make sure you don't drown in the bathtub. You know, if you need some help, they've got anonymous programs for that, right? You should look into it. Jen cares about you, but she preferred you when you were sober. Another red bubble. There were more messages waiting below. 
I was hesitant, but still curious as I scrolled downward, finding that Elijah had left a handful of short, aggressive messages just a second ago. Answer me. Where's my girlfriend? You know, don't you? Evelyn, I know you're reading this. He was typing again, and seconds later, another message appeared. They all die on that mountain. Every. Single. One. I closed down the browser and slammed the laptop shut as quickly as I possibly could. His words struck me instantly with the sudden fear that if I'd stayed on that page, I would have seen and read far more than I wanted to. They all die, he had said. <laughs> who is they? The people who worked here before? Hikers? Climbers? I'm still not sure if his words were a threat or a concern. I'm no detective, but I'm worried that the nothing here is coincidental. I know my coworker will read this, and I'm sorry to her in advance, but I just can't pretend that all of this doesn't fit together somehow. Evelyn, if you're reading this, I hope you can remember what you saw that night in the woods. I was going to post this earlier, stopping where I did above, but I'm glad I chose not to. It's evening now as I put this down, and something has happened outside the radio station. I'm realizing the full weight of working around the clock. There's boredom, especially being alone, and a tension that has been putting me on edge. I was fitted for a hearing aid, which I received just a day or two earlier, and somehow, being able to hear decently from both ears again made the silence even more daunting. That, and I've noticed a faint sting in that ear ever since I came back to the station. I gave the evening news and prepared for another 30-minute block of music, with time to spare and no real interest in trying to hear any muffled bits of music through the headphone. I paced around the room, took a few moments to just peer out the window, and the purple glow from the sunset, I saw something that caught my attention. There was a man out there, standing upright, but swaying slowly side to side. Now, I would have been suspicious that this was something unnatural, considering how many times the woods had messed with both of our minds, but I recognized him. He worked for a service that brought groceries to the station twice a week. He was facing away from me, staring off into the woods. I watched him intently, hoping he didn't take another step. Those last words Jennifer's boyfriend had sent to Evelyn's messenger rang in my head again. They all die on that mountain. Every. Single. One. In hindsight, I did the stupidest thing I ever could have done. I went out there. The thing is, I knew it was a bad idea, but three people had died in the woods in a matter of days, maybe even hours. I didn't want to witness one more person getting lost and being pulled out in a body bag. I abandoned the broadcast room, running down that long, winding staircase down to the exit. It was almost impossible to see it, but a very dim shimmer from the outdoor light led me there. When I whipped open the door and ran outside to tell the man to come back, I saw only one of his feet had stepped into the darkness between the trees, already pushing his way through the brush. It was a bit foolish, but I wouldn't say I'm stupid. I didn't follow him into the woods. I yelled at him to come back, but he didn't even seem to register what I had said. Or that I was there. Instead, my eyes dropped to the ground where I saw he had dropped a cardboard box. Why would he make a delivery this late at night? As I stood up to pick it up, I heard the crunch of branches and the rustle of leaves. I thought it was him, turning back around, realizing maybe his mistake. It wasn't the grocery guy. It was something so much fucking worse. I saw Jennifer walking out of the woods, making a path towards me. Only, I'm not sure walking was the right word. Her neck was broken, her back was twisted, and her legs were snapped in directions that made my skin crawl, just hearing the sounds her bones made as she moved. One arm was twisted backwards at the shoulder, wrist dangling so loosely I thought it might fall right off. She shambled towards me, putting weight on whatever parts of her legs would support her, but she looked like a dirt-covered marionette being operated by a puppeteer that had no idea what they were doing. There were twigs, dead leaves, and bits of long grass sticking out of her hair and stuffed into her open mouth. The sound she made was completely unnatural like breathless gasping mixed with these low, guttural noises. I couldn't even tell if she was looking at me. Her eyes were milky white, and her head rolled back and forth loosely on her snap neck. Without even thinking, I abandoned the box on the ground. Whatever was in there didn't mean a goddamn thing anymore. I ran back to the bottom of the tower, practically throwing myself back into the building before slamming the door behind me and locking it as fast as I could. I peered out the window 
It was a mistake. Jennifer was inches away from the door. Her head snapped back to the front so that her face was right there in front of me. I don't know how she got there so quickly, and I honestly don't give a fuck. In that moment, all I wanted was to get as far away as I could. I ran up the staircase, pure fear and adrenaline pushing me to the top without so much as a second to pause. I didn't care about the grocery guy anymore. Just being locked in the broadcast room was all I wanted. That and the comforting sunlight. It was still so many hours from the morning. I locked myself in, getting as far away from the door as I could, avoiding the window for fear that I'd see her shambling up the fire escape. Her face, I can't get her face out of my head. It's almost midnight. As I write this, I just got a call on my cell phone, and I have never been so relieved to hear someone else's voice. When I picked it up, I, I would have been happy for anyone to answer me, just, just another living, breathing human being to talk to. Daniel, Daniel, are, are you there? My heart skipped a beat. It was Evelyn. She sounded tired, but it was her voice, without a single doubt. Where are you? I asked her, skipping all pleasantries. I think she heard the panic when I spoke. Please, please, please tell me you're not in jail. They, they didn't arrest me. I think they wanted to find a reason to, but I'm coming back. I'll be there before six. That's all I can promise. I'll catch up to speed when I see you. She must have heard me let out the biggest sigh of breath because her next words sound concerned. Dan, what's wrong? I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. It was a lie, but my nerves weren't ready to have that discussion. Just be careful. Get here safe. I will, she agreed softly, but I could tell she didn't call just to let me know she was alive and returning. There's a storm coming tomorrow. A really, really shitty one. High winds, lightning, power outages, maybe... She didn't need to explain why that was a reason to worry. There was impossible pressure keeping control of this place, and still I didn't even know why this radio station was the center of every weird thing happening in these mountains. All of a sudden, I had a feeling that I, I hadn't really noticed until just now. I realized just how much this job and this place had changed my life. Evelyn? Yeah? I spared a glance at the window, relieved but surprised that Jennifer wasn't there. However, I did see a small, unnerving sight. Twigs. Long grass and bits of dead leaves and hair littered at the top of the stairwell, making a path down the steps. How long was she standing there before she disappeared? As soon as we, uh, we get a couple more part-timers, <laughs> we're taking a vacation. This is Daniel with 104.6 FM, and I've never been so eager for an early morning in my life. I have so much news to tell, and yet I don't really know where to start. But first, let me clarify. This is Evelyn. I returned to the radio station at about 5.45 in the morning. Was it was it one day ago? Two days ago? I'll be honest, I, sometimes I'm not even sure how long I'm here or what day of the week it is anymore. I screamed at Dan for a while and locked him in the bathroom for about 15 minutes before I realized that he was sincerely just trying to be helpful and make sense out of the whole thing. I still wish he had stayed off my social media though. Now I'm adding putting a 30-year-old man in timeout onto my list of activities I never thought I'd be doing at the workplace. But while I was gone, I saw, heard, and experienced so much that I have to just sit down and tell you everything from start to finish. The storm is on its way and the lights have flickered a few times already due to the winds. I'm typing this as quickly as I can because, well, I'll be honest, I don't know what will happen after I submit this. When the police picked me up from the radio station, they didn't really give the impression that they were questioning me as a suspect of Jennifer's murder. I was never put in handcuffs, I was never put in a cell, but they didn't want me out of their sights until we had a good, long conversation. However, as soon as we arrived, I was inspected a bit too carefully, as a woman in gloves waved a little flashlight in front of my eyes and told me to strip down to my tank top so that they could inspect my arms. I immediately had my suspicions. 
Did they think I was shooting up at the radio station? High out of my mind? Like, it lasted far too long, and I had to go through a seemingly unnecessary amount of searches and swaps before I was finally able to sit down, all of my items confiscated except for my clothes. When one of the investigators came by to question me in a private room there at the police station, I voiced my concerns. Listen, I'm not a junkie, I told him. Perhaps a bit too aggressively? I thought we were here to talk about my friend? We are. He sat down at the other end of the table. In contrast to my bitterness, he seemed far more concerned than he was watchful or judgmental of me. But due to your exposure... We're going to have to get your permission for a full medical exam before we do any of that. What exposure? He seemed hesitant to explain, but I had a feeling that he couldn't just keep it from me. At the radio station? If there's something dangerous in the air out there, I deserve to know what I'm getting around. The detective shook his head. Nothing like that. I'm not talking about radiation or a gas leak. He folded his hands on the table as he continued. We see a lot of people coming down with illnesses or sustaining injuries outside of the town, and while we can't explain it, we've learned to be very thorough when it comes to making sure anyone who spends a considerable amount of time in the woods is safe. I had only just gotten there, and already I felt confused. I felt as if so much was hidden from me, so much that I wanted to know, but wasn't being allowed to understand. The detective didn't say any more, but instead he slid a piece of paper across the table. We need your permission for a full medical examination and an overnight stay. After we're sure you're in decent shape, tomorrow we'll talk about your friend. What was I supposed to do? Refuse? I found it all very strange, but I admit that I was curious how all of this fit together with the goings-on at the radio station. It was all seeming like some kind of inside job, or perhaps some knowledge that I hadn't been awarded that everyone else knew about. I allowed them to do the medical exam taking samples of my blood and basically everything else they could get their hands on. I was questioned a lot about the bruising on my chest, but when they had been assured it was from an honest injury and not some disorder in the blood, I was permitted to get a night's rest before being picked up first thing in the morning. I saw the same investigator, a middle-aged man with dark skin. He had a low voice that sounded nice, but I still couldn't shake this feeling that he wasn't any kind of friend to me. I picked at the glue exposed on the frayed edge of my paper hospital bracelet in an attempt to get it off cleanly, but the residue just collected under my fingernails. Evelyn Faye McKinnon. He wasn't asking, but clarifying. He rifled through a stack of papers and I found myself growing impatient. You were arrested twice in the last 12 months, DUIs both times, you and your roommate, former roommate, I corrected, you and your former roommate jennifer cook were fined one time for a domestic disturbance we had a purely verbal argument i had just gotten out of the hospital and she started lecturing about my point is the detective spoke with such a piercing tone that i shut my mouth immediately letting him talk we had your fingerprints and we matched them to a set of prints on jennifer cook's cell phone which we found a half mile from your workplace next to a tree filled with blood I squinted my eyes. Filled was a word I hadn't thought to hear, not unless Tresap was the subject of the conversation. At that point, I think he could sense the question I was about to ask. What do you, what do you mean filled with blood? I mean the tree was oozing several quarts of blood right from a hole in the center of the trunk, and Jennifer's cell phone, the one with both her and your fingerprints, was found at the base of it. He gave me an icy stare, and I was waiting for a question. I was waiting to somehow be blamed. I didn't have anything to do with... Again, he didn't let me finish. But his words both comforted and confused me. Nobody thinks you were the one to hurt her, he said. But we need to know what you saw in there. Anybody, anything you might have witnessed. We received an anonymous tip saying there were three bodies in the forest, and clearly three bodies were not recovered. It's very very important that we find her and that we find it soon. The urgency in his tone was somewhat shocking to me. I imagine Jennifer's family would want her remains, but the way he looked at me was almost desperate, as if finding her body was more important than just for the sake of her loved ones. She was in the tree, 
I explained, though I knew how insane it would sound. Stuffed in the center of it. Um, I don't really even know how she fit, but her face and one arm were sticking out of it. She was dead, her mouth was stuffed with a bird's nest, and that's where she was when we turned around and left. He nodded slowly, and I knew that none of that would help them actually find her. It wasn't as if they hadn't checked the entire area probably ten times over by now. Anything else? He asked with raised eyebrows. Anyone. Any. Thing. Strange. Out there. I found myself hesitating. What kind of strange was he asking about? I mean, I had weird stories and sightings. Oh, man, I had plenty. But at what point would it become too crazy to talk about? No one else. I mean, I I saw some weird mutated elk, though. It had three back legs. It was was really fucked up looking. Weird eyes, too. Um, The other other two bodies, um, they were on the ground and up in the tree in pieces, but, but that was all. Pieces, the investigator asked. I gave him a quizzical look, wondering how he hadn't known the other two people had been split in half. That was a detail that wasn't overlooked so easily. Yeah, the the man and the woman, they were both cut in half at the middle. The man's legs and, oh God, and and the woman's top half were stuck. um, Oh God, they they were stuck in the tree as if they'd been um, tossed in there. It sounds stupid, but that's exactly what it looked like. He was flipping through his papers again, pulling out photographs and files. I saw only a glimpse, but I recognized the forest floor, the grass covered in blood, and the colors of the torn fabrics one of the bodies wore. With a sigh, he pulled out one photograph in particular and slid it in front of me on the table. It was the scene, obviously, but the photo had been taken far enough away to show the entirety of the area's surroundings. I grimaced as I saw the faraway shapes of the two dead individuals and the bloodstained tree, now empty, where Jennifer would have been. However, I was surprised to see that the limbs of the other tree were completely and utterly bare. There was no sign that the man's legs nor the woman's head had ever been there. They they were there. I saw the woman's body and her face and, and what she looked like. As I rattled on, the detective stood from his seat and fished a cell phone out from his pants pocket, dialing a number quickly and turning away from me. He spoke in a hushed voice, but I could still hear him. It sounded urgent. It wasn't just her. There are three of them now. He said, his free hand rubbing at his forehead with his eyes squinting shut in his stress. They were obviously moved, but if if we can't find her, the others must have already left also. If that's the case, it's too late. They're a part of it. He hung up the phone, and I watched him return to his seat, so many questions tumbling over one another in my head. What's going on? I asked him, annoyed. A part of what? Why are you asking me about fucking animals? I thought we were looking for Jennifer. It's all important, but you don't need to worry, he told me sternly. If it's important, I should know. I work out there. I'm the one giving you all that I know. And what the hell was that with medical exam? Or, or, I mean, what are we in danger of? What exactly are we in danger of that no one is telling us about? I watched the investigator lean back in his chair, his expression as calm and cold as it was before. He waited for my outburst to end, but the look in his eyes had a sharpness to it that spoke of some reluctance, as if I were asking too much for him. But when I didn't choose to leave, he had no choice but to lean forward and speak. People go missing. Several, sometimes dozens, a year on that mountain. Sometimes their bodies were found, sometimes they weren't, but they never return as themselves. And it's not just the people. We hire rangers to collect any dead animals they find and get them out of the woods, but far too often... Those rangers don't come back either. I was silent for a long moment, processing his words. None of it was making sense yet. What happens to them then? I asked an obvious question. We can't explain it. He continued in a hoarse whisper, but sometimes people have said strange things. They've gone for a walk in the woods and said that they saw a rabbit with one human ear or maybe a bush with fingers growing out of place of a few branches. Uh, One time, an old woman nearly scared her son to death because she tried to coax a deer out of the forest, saying it had her husband's eyes. Her husband had died collapsing on a woodland trail one month earlier, and she said that she had fused... Well, she said that he had fused with a deer. I felt sick, thinking of those human eyes. I didn't need to make it up for my imagination at at all. (laughs) That bird, that damn bird, 
I started to wonder whose eyes those were after all. The detective continued. We don't know what's around in the air around here, but they're making people see this kind of shit. All we know is that when the fog season comes around, more people go missing and more weird things start to appear. It's all around that spot too, your radio station. Maybe there's some magnetic disturbance, maybe there's something under the ground. We don't know. He leaned closer across the table and I didn't even try to say a word. I just stared, exhaling through my lips as he continued looking me straight in the eyes with a look that was dire. One thing we do know though, in the last five years, we've hired 27 different people to speak over that radio. You and Mr. Esperanza, you're 28 and 29. I know the cliche of a heart dropping is overdone and insensible, but I felt it then. My heart wasn't in my chest anymore. It had sunk so low that I felt every bit of confidence and safety in my body disappear all at once. One thing was bothering me though. One little thing that had been in my head for a while now that I was just piecing together. We've hired? He didn't avoid the question, but he took a good, long moment to answer. Finally, he shook his head, sinking back down in his chair across from me. The broadcast tower is a lot more than just a radio station. You know that by now. People around here feel safer when they think they just uh, have the music, and that's what we're trying to do. Keep everyone calm until we know how to get rid of this problem forever. It was making more sense to me now why the station was so high off the ground and why it had to be on air at all times. Whatever signal we sent out wasn't there just for people to enjoy. The music was just a mask covering something that served a more defensive purpose. It was a watchtower. The broadcast station was never for entertainment, but for protection. What, what would happen if the broadcast stopped for good? I asked with a small hint of fear in my voice. I didn't like to think about it, but I needed to know. The man across from me shrugged his shoulders with a heavy sigh. We don't know, but we never want to find out. The fog has stretched all across the town before, and we think that potentially it could keep going as far as we let it. And whatever is in that fog has been stealing people away. That married couple that went missing the last time it crept into town, well, you saw firsthand what happened to them. And now when the fog rolls around next time, we may be seeing them again. He stood up from his seat, walking around the table and giving me a heavy pat on the shoulder as I sat there. Brain, gone to mush. You'd better get back to your station. Number 28. That morning, I took a cab back to the radio station before the sun came up, but before I did, I made one brief stop along the way. In the early hours of dawn, I walked to Jennifer's house. The same one she had kicked me out of, and the same one where her boyfriend Elijah now lived on his own. I didn't knock or ring the doorbell, but I did slip a small piece of paper under the door. It was the only printed photo I had of Jennifer carried around in my wallet next to a photo of my parents. And now, um, now it was his. Daniel filled me in when I arrived back to the tower, and after I had a bit of a fit, which may have been a lot of a fit, I tried to fill him in on what I had learned as well. It was a lot to relay and a lot for him to understand, but I felt better knowing that he wasn't any more in the dark than I was. So the people that hired us, not really a network. I finished the idea for him. It's some, uh, some like, agency or, or town government. I don't know. That's why our signal only reaches so far. There's really no reason for it to expand. Daniel looked overwhelmed, and I didn't blame him. <laughs> I mean, hell, I wasn't feeling so great about all of this either. I went from being stressed about some weird shit to suddenly knowing that a lot of people could get hurt if we failed at our jobs. When I told Daniel about all of the former employees who had gone missing, he was visibly shaken. Um, what, what happens to them? His voice was weak. Do, do they die? Do, do they quit? I, I don't think they quit, Dan. We shared a silent moment between us. We didn't say it, but we were both thinking the same thing. How long would we last? And if we didn't survive, which one of us would be the first to go? A rumble of thunder interrupted any other conversations that may have happened next. Both of us snapped our attention to the window where the heavy clouds were rolling in across the sky and the trees furthest in our view had started to sway back and forth from the winds. A flash of lightning cracked through the dim light and was followed by another deep bellow from the sky. 
the same low, roaring groan that sounded like an angry god. Evelyn, this, uh, this place has a generator, doesn't it? He asked as the lights flickered for the first time. The radio skipped to static for a split second as another deep rumble resonated from the mountain. Yeah. Where is it? I frowned, giving him an almost apologetic look. Um, outside? This is number 28 from the 104.6 emergency outpost. A fog advisory is in effect. Stay calm, stay safe, stay indoors. The forest was alive. Even before the fog came, we could see it moving and wriggling with electric energy as the thunder roared overhead and lightning cracked at the top of the mountain. I'll admit for a moment, I, I actually wondered if a forest fire would be preferable. Obviously death hadn't been enough to keep Jennifer and countless others from coming back in some form, and so I later decided that setting every strange abomination on fire would only create more dangers for us. <laughs> Look, I won't beat around the bush. We were scared. We knew enough and had seen enough to know that we wouldn't be safe. As the rain poured down and the cables and lines swayed from side to side off the tower, Daniel and I were not only afraid for our own safety, but for everyone else's. This broadcast tower was keeping the town alive. We were keeping the town alive. An alcoholic and a failed theater actor? <laughs> Who knew? The lights flickered again, prompting the broadcast to turn to static and skip as I scrambled behind the desk to get the sound going again. For mere seconds, the waves would go silent and then spring to life again just as a rumble would vibrate underneath the tower. I noticed Daniel flinch, holding one of his ears just moments before the broadcast came back and static filled music played again. You hurt? I asked him, but he shook his head, stretching out his jaw. No, my ears won't stop ringing though. I shrugged it away, imagining all of those cliché excuses. It's the weather, or the pressure is different up in the mountains. So on, and so on. But he bounced back immediately, marching over to the window to scan his eyes over the dreary-looking forest. It was hard to see much of anything through the rain, but he squinted to make out shapes on the horizon. There's something moving out there, he said almost breathlessly. Far away, but it's getting closer. It's hard to see. I didn't need to see for myself to know what he was looking at. In the midst of the rain and the lightning, the fog would still find a way to roll in. After all, it wasn't really a product of the weather at all. It was more of a living thing, or rather an amalgamation of all formerly living things on this side of the mountain range. I need you to run the emergency broadcast. I told him as I pushed away from the console and popped up out of my chair. A strong wind whipped past, rattling the walls and making the wooden floorboards creak underneath our feet. I felt unsteady, suddenly worried the old stilts holding us up would give in and we'd crash down into the trees below. And the only thing worse than the fall would be the exposure to the open woods, should we even survive the way down. The floor rumbled as if the building itself were breathing before it settled back into place. I looked at Daniel and he looked back at me. We both knew we'd have to be prepared for the worst the storm could do. As he practically fell into the chair, turning on the microphone to broadcast a crackling message over the air, I rummaged in the storage closet for industrial-sized flashlights and the keys to the generator shed. Now, all of this supplies made more sense to me. The backpacks, the emergency food rations, first aid kits, flares, fire starting kits. This place was never meant to be a radio station. It was most likely a ranger lookout that had been adapted into something capable of large-scale broadcasting. While knocking things out of my way in search of the keys, I found a pack of walkie-talkies and checked them for batteries. Daniel was already done with his announcement by the time I found him and appeared at my side to snatch one out of my hand. He seemed to be thinking the same thing. If the power went out, one of us would have to go out there to turn on the generator. One of us. We couldn't risk both of our lives with nobody to take over the responsibility. Did you start the music again? I asked him. Daniel nodded. It's going, he said. But the lack of confidence in his voice spoke of a deeper thought. It was running now. But if the lights continued to flicker, it might not be for much longer. There was nothing else to do but wait. As the fog bounded through the forest, moving the trees with the weight of its eerie inhabitants, I could only watch as it engulfed the entire woodland. 
I had never seen the fog rest at the edge of the forest, but it did this time. Something about the music, or rather the signal, kept it from crossing that line between us and the town further down the mountain. We unplugged our headsets, letting the music play in the studio for us both to hear, and sat down at the edge of the window on the floor. It was the calm before the storm, as we stared at the swaying poles and wires outside, wondering which one would be the first to snap or end up snagged in a tree. A moment passed, but it was a long and excruciating moment of silence. Dan was the first to break it, as his talkative self almost always was. You, you want to know what I did before this? He asked, but I knew he'd tell me anyway. I nodded still. After I graduated with a master's degree in performance arts, <laughs> a master's degree, the only acting job I could get was recording a commercial for some plumbing service. I recorded lines in an actual studio, talking about toilets for 20 takes. And you know the worst part? He laughed, looking over with this stupid, somewhat disheartened grin. They didn't even pick mine. I heard the commercial on the radio in my car, and it was someone else completely. Never in my life did I think I'd be legitimately pissed because I wasn't chosen as a spokesman for toilet cleaning. That actually made me laugh, even if it was a bittersweet moment of lightheartedness. I shrugged my shoulders with an expression of nonchalance. <laughs> Go figures you'd get let down by the radio twice. I gestured to the room around us and Daniel snorted mid-chuckle. What about you? He asked in return. Tell me a stupid thing you've done. I had to think for a moment, not because I couldn't recall any, but because there was really too much to recall. Somehow, all of my stupid mistakes just ended up, well, sad. I, um, I almost died in a bathtub once, I said, chuckling, even if it wasn't at all that funny. Daniel seemed unsure if he should laugh or not. Look, I was shit-faced, and I felt terrible, so I wanted to take a bath, and I ended up passing out almost the second I got in, and Jennifer found me after I had apparently flipped face down. She honestly thought it was a suicide until they got me breathing again and found out I was still just as hammered as when I went in. That time I laughed, but Daniel didn't. I even knew it wasn't funny, but I was desperate to grab at straws just to find a reason to take it lightly. When I saw the severity of the frown on his face, my smile disappeared and I suddenly felt like a child being scolded. How long have you been sober? He asked. I didn't need to question how he knew it was an ongoing thing. After all, he'd seen enough on my computer to know most of the truth by now. I felt a tightness in my throat and the breath I took in next was shaky and uneven. Um... My, uh, my, uh, my, my, my first, my first sober day was the day I came into work a few, a few weeks ago. <laughs> I had to bite my bottom lip to keep from letting it tremble. Putting it into perspective felt pathetic, reminding me of just how soon it was. Um, the only reason I'm not drunk right now is because the fucking grocery guy only brings me cheap, shitty iced tea. That time we both laughed, but it didn't last. In a second, amusement turned to tears as I unwillingly felt a sob escape me, both of my hands covering my face. With my eyes squeezed shut, I only felt Daniel's hand pat between my shoulders and remain there until I covered my face. I refused to let myself cry out loud. Those thoughts and feelings were pushed back down as my eyes returned to the fog at the edge of the forest. I watched it move and swirl. Many eyes and many shapes moving and twitching as if waiting eagerly to be allowed further. The shed was so close to the edge. Too close. A familiar pair of eyes stared back at us then, up in the tree, free from the fog, and hopping near to tap its beak at the window. It was that damn bird again. I looked at it closer this time. Its eyes were hazel. Now I found myself wondering less where it came from and who it had borrowed those eyes from. What did you see? I heard Daniel's voice, but didn't process it at first. With a deep breath, I wiped away the tears from my face and turned to him with a hmm of confusion. At the graduation party, you were in the woods and you saw something, didn't you? The word graduation in and of itself made my stomach sink. I looked away from Dan again, squinting as I struggled to bring those thoughts forward. Somehow, just looking for the memory caused an internal pain. I, um, 
I didn't know there was anything fucked up about the woods back then. I said, I told you that I left here, right? When I was a really little kid, um, my dad died and my mom remarried. So we moved in with him out of town. And I came back the week of graduation with a bunch of people I used to know as kids. And they all said that the woods had gotten creepy since I left. Bits and pieces were still missing from my thought process, but I was piecing them together in the moments that I paused and kept silent. It was some terrible puzzle slowly coming into view, and it made my face turn to a grimace. I wandered off, probably because it was loud and everyone was acting like an ass, but out in the woods I heard heard something. Um, it was like a low growl, I thought at first, but now that I remember the sound, it um, it was it was a it was a voice. A low, gravelly, painful groan. This animal stepped out of the bushes, and I, and I thought for sure it was like some kind of cougar or maybe like a wild dog. Um, but it's its face. Oh my god! It it had it had this face, yellow eyes like a wild cat, but but the nose and the mouth were were, were different. They were they were human and um, and familiar. He looked at me. And I saw his mouth move like he was trying to say something, but all that came out was this this terrible rattle, like it hurt it to breathe. It sounded like he was suffering, like it took everything he had just to say a single word. Um, I, I ran back to the party and I drank and I drank and I fucking drank until I couldn't remember that thing's face anymore. And it worked for a good long time, but you know what, now, now that I'm sober, all it took was thinking about it once for it to be stuck in my head again. <laughs> Dan gave me an apologetic look, as if he had some reason to feel sorry about it all. His hand fell on my back again and he opened his mouth to speak. I'm sure it would have been some great words of wisdom or encouragement, but he never had the chance. There was a flash of lightning and a deafening crack as it struck one of the poles standing around the station. The thunder blended into the sound of the crackling radio for a split second before the lights went down, the sound stopped, and we were plunged into a dark, thick silence. All I could see in the dark were Dan's eyes, illuminated by the flashes of lightning as he watched the forest's edge. The fog twisted and moved in patterns of rolls, tumbling over itself like a living beast as it crawled towards us. It was almost too dark to see, but my eyes could make out blots of shapes inside the fog arms, legs, bodies, all of them eager to inhabit the land that they had been barred from until now. The mist swirled around the stilts of the tower, creeping upwards before we had no choice but to make a split decision. Daniel turned on his walkie-talkie, testing it by holding it up to his mouth. I could hear the crackle of his voice come through mine, even from just a few feet apart. I'll let you know when I've got it going. I told him sternly, jumping to my feet. I was about to push open the fire escape with no hesitation, but I felt a rough hand grab the back of my shirt before I had the chance. Stay in here so you can get the radio going. No, I answered flatly, refusing to follow that order. There was a scowl pulling at the edges of my lips as I glared at him. I wasn't there when you got hurt, and I couldn't help Jennifer either, so just let me do- let me do this. We stared at one another for almost too long, but I could feel him slowly letting go of my shirt. His arm dropped, giving back my freedom to move, and he nodded his head once in silence. Daniel, if you're reading this, you snooping bastard. Thank you. The door took a heavy burst, but I shoved it open and was surprised for a moment when I didn't hear an alarm. Of course, it didn't take long to remember that the power outage had taken everything, not just the lights and the radio signal. The fog was already rising, covering the ground and crawling upwards over the sides of the building. It was only moments before I was trapped inside of it, not sure whether to run for my life or take it slowly to stay hidden. It would have been no use. They knew I was there already. I held my flashlight in shaky hands to illuminate the steps of the fire escape. There were no vines, no slimy, mud-covered appendages, and nothing waiting there to trip me. Still, I didn't trust that the fire escape was unoccupied. I could hear a faint clank from the bottom, as if something was trying to pull itself up to open the door behind me. The sound in that fog was maddening. The amalgamates were suffering inside of themselves, parasites eating off of one another and groaning in some constant pain. The ones that didn't moan and cry in their torment were voicing aggressive growls or rattling breasts as they searched through the fog for another living thing to tear apart and add to their collection of stolen bodies. 
My flashlight caught a glimpse now and again of milky white eyes or the glimmer of rain-soaked skin or fur. I didn't dare look back, but I could hear and feel the crash of weight against the fire escape as if something was trying to crawl its way up underneath a section as I passed. Once the end of the stairs was in sight, I made it my goal to run to the shed as quickly as possible and lock myself in immediately until the generator would start. The problem would be getting out. My light caught the end of the step and there I saw what had been making all of the noise. A woman's face stared up at me with dead, pale blue eyes. She was dragging herself, her upper body struggling to leave the ground and crawl its way up as her lower half was weighing her down. This half of a woman, one I remembered seeing sprawled over the branch of a tree, was being engulfed in roots and barks. The living plant her corpse had been fused with pushed itself along the ground, but clumsily, as if it was too heavy and too scattered in its movements to make any kind of progress. Her arms, however, were still moving and capable of grabbing me if I got too close. The worst part was how pleadingly she looked at me, as if the human part of her was begging for a way to get out. I couldn't help but feel that the aggression was fear, but it didn't tug on my heartstrings quite enough to convince me to stop. I jumped up and over the edge of the stairs, falling only a couple of feet from the ground and making a straight line to the shed. The keys in my pocket jingled and slipped between my fingers as I tried to find the right one, all while too aware of every shadow and every glimmer of eyes creeping closer. The fog was too thick to see well. My flashlight only served to show me that there was nothing directly in front of my eyes, but it was perhaps a blessing that the creatures hunting in the fog were stuck in it just as much as I was. I still sensed that they knew I was there, searching and struggling to catch anything in their grasp. I even heard the shriek of one, like the sound of a whining animal in pain as it was caught in the clutches of another, larger and likely more terrifying beast. I felt the surface of the wood in front of me, whispering words of relief as I padded along the edge of the shed until the door was at my fingertips. A pair of keys were fished from my pocket, and my clumsy fingers struggled to swiftly find the one small bit of metal that I needed. Just then, I heard a crackle. It was the walkie-talkie connected to my hip, Daniel's voice on the other end. Did you find it yet? He asked, but I felt my stomach tie up in knots when his voice rang out over the silence. I wasn't the only one to hear him. Heavy grunts and stomps of feet like hooves digging into the dirt surrounded me. I could hear the shriek of something vaguely avian mixed with a human-like scream and bellowing roars that shook my skull from the inside. I was in a rush to open the door, trying every key as I blindly searched for the right one. Finally, as I prepared to swing the door open, I could feel the vibration in the ground as something heavy and tall landed by my side as if jumping from the tops of the trees. In the blinding fog, I could see brown and gray fur spotted with blood. It smelled like rotten flesh and mold, its joints cracking and groaning as it bent down to my level. I could see its eyes in my peripheral vision, at least six of them, pale stained with flecks of jaundiced yellow sitting above an elk-like snout. Its antlers scraped the side of the wood with a terrible, jaw-clinching sound. I felt a touch to my back and recognized it immediately. The spider-like appendages that had brushed my arms on the last day of the fog weren't the legs of some giant spider, but this thing's, it's this thing's fingers. It breathed in, then out with a rattle, and the stench of blood and death was warm against the side of my face. When I told Daniel that almost drowning in a bathtub was the stupidest thing I'd done, I meant it. It was the stupidest thing I had done yet, but this day, <laughs> I changed all of that. I threw the shed door open, stepping out of the way to let the heavy wooden plank hit the hulking beast beside me, directly in its nose, moving quicker than I ever had in my life. I slipped into the shed and jammed the door shut behind me, locking it up tight and throwing anything I could find in front of it as I heard the beast bellow more in annoyance than in pain. My light shone on the generator, but I had to work quickly. I felt a tremble in the floor as whatever stood outside knocked against the door so roughly that it caused dust and debris to fly into the air. I fumbled with a can of oil, spilling a bit of it onto my shoes and my pants, but still managing to fill the machine as that thing outside rounded the edge of the shed in only two large steps. It pounded on the roof, big enough and powerful enough to cause the wooden beams above my head to crack, bit by bit. I threw the nearly empty oil can to the side and tried to find every button and switch in order before the ceiling collapsed under the weight of that thing's fists. 
I flipped the switch, then the second, knocking my fist against it as I impatiently waited to hear it spring to life. Dan! I yelled over the walkie-talkie. I've almost got it. You have to get ready to switch the breakers, though. They're downstairs. Go! I heard his voice, but it was muffled and his words weren't making sense over the endless crackle. Oh my god, I hope he heard me. I felt a pain in the back of my head as a bit of wood from the ceiling fell with another forceful hit, and suddenly I could see a pale light from above as the foggy sky became visible. A hole had been punched in the ceiling, but in moments, it was blacked out by the multiple eyes of that tall, decaying abomination from the woods. I flipped the last switch and the generator began to rumble. It was a success. And regardless of whether or not I survived to escape this crumbling, wooden hazard, the station would have power in moments. I staggered back, clothes and hair smelling like oil, staring up at the pale eyes above the roof with frightened defiance. The shed rattled another hard punch or kick, hitting it from the side where I stood. It was enough to push me forward and knock me onto my hands and knees, but it didn't last. I could hear it before I saw it. The lights outside buzzed as they all came alive, one at a time, bathing the entire clearing with a yellow light. That's when I heard my device crackle again, Daniel's voice speaking clearly on the other side. I can't get the radio started, he told me in a panic. It's, it's, there's, there's not enough power to run it, it won't work. It seemed like a failure at first, but then I remembered that stupid, laminated piece of paper I'd been staring at for the last month on my desk. Rule number one, when the radio is down, activate the bell. I was only pissed that he'd be the one to push it after that button had been so tempting to me since my first day. See the button on the wall? The one behind the case. Push it! I shouted back to him sternly. Don't hesitate. Just just push it! I could hear him on the other end, fiddling with the case before he did exactly as I said. The next thing I heard was surprising. Nothing. I didn't hear a damn thing. At least not from the speakers on top of the radio tower. Instead, I heard Dan let on a pained yell and fumble around the room before a small mechanical whine and clatter followed. Later, I would learn what that was. It was Dan throwing his hearing aid across the room. The creature outside didn't disappear. Rather, they became noisy in their pained and agitated sounds, rumbling past and dragging themselves away in any way that they could. They were retreating to the forest, bothered by some sound that my ears just couldn't pick up. A drone, perhaps too high or too low for my ears to hear, was driving them off. The bell, just like every other tool around here, was solely there to control them all along. Or rather, to control the forest itself. The eyes disappeared around the hole in the ceiling and I could hear the hulking creature above me slowly stomping away, resigning itself to return to the mountain. My legs felt like jelly and my head was pounding, but I still managed to find the door and push my way out into the fresh air again, just as a glimpse of a giant mud-covered hoof disappeared into the tree line. Daniel had propped open the fire escape when I came back up, slowly and exhaustively forcing my way to the top. The lights were on, the radio was off, but we were safe for the time being. The first thing my coworker did was pull me into a hug, lifting me a few inches off the ground and saying these profound, thoughtful words to me. You smell like petroleum. I wish I could say that that was the last time anything weird has happened here, but as you can guess, a day or two has passed and everything is still bullshit. The sink doesn't cry anymore, but we still get some weird calls and Dan told me that it rained pebbles the other day. I told him I was pissed off that he didn't collect any for me like a baby otter. I'm sure things will always be weird around here and there's always going to be a story to tell, but for now, I think I'm going to focus on doing my job and lasting a bit longer than the employees 1 through 27. But I'm sure if you don't hear from me, Dan will be sneaking on my laptop again someday. I could change my password, but nah. This is Evelyn at 104.6 Emergency Broadcast Station. And in case you were wondering, that bird, still out there, Daniel decided to name it Bartholomew. I fucking hate Bartholomew.